Welcome to Ubermensch Audiobooks. We upload a new audiobook in full length every Saturday. Subscribe to our channel to never miss a new video. Click the bell to get notified whenever we upload. If you like the topic of this video, let us know by giving it a thumbs up, or if you don't like it, tell us what topics we should cover in the comments section. Publisher's Explanation and Preface to Character Building This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Luke Sartor Character Building by Booker T. Washington Publisher's Explanation Mr. Washington's habit has for many years been to deliver a practical, straightforward address to the students of Tuskegee Institute on Sunday evening. These addresses have had much to do with the building up of the character of his race, for they are very forcible explanations of character building. The speaker has put into them his whole moral earnestness, his broad common sense, and, in many places, his eloquence. Many of Mr. Washington's friends have said that some of these addresses are the best of his utterances. They have an additional interest, because they show him at his work, and give an inside view of the school. This volume is made up of selections from these addresses, chosen by Mr. Washington himself. End of Publisher's Explanation Preface to Character Building A number of years ago, when the Tuskegee Normal and Industrial Institute was quite small, with only a few dozen students and two or three teachers, I began the practice of giving what were called Sunday evening talks to the students and teachers. These addresses were always delivered in a conversational tone, and much in the same manner that I would speak to my own children around my fireside. As the institution gradually grew from year to year, friends suggested that these addresses ought to be preserved, and for that reason, during the past few years they have been stenographically reported. For the purpose of this book, they have been somewhat revised, and I am greatly indebted to my secretary, Mr. Emmett J. Scott, and to Mr. Max Bennett Thrasher for assisting me in the revision and in putting them into proper shape for publication, and to Mr. T. Thomas Fortune for suggesting that these addresses be published in book form. In these addresses, I have attempted from week to week to speak straight to the hearts of our students and teachers and visitors concerning the problems and questions that confront them in their daily life here in the South. The most encouraging thing in connection with the making of these addresses has been the close attention which the students and teachers and visitors have always paid, and the hearty way in which they have spoken to me of the help that they have received from them. During the past four years these addresses have been published in the school paper each week. This paper, the Tuskegee Student, has a wide circulation among our graduates and others in the South, so that in talking to our students on Sunday evening, I have felt in a degree that I was speaking to a large proportion of the coloured people in the South. If there is anything in these addresses which will be of interest or service to a still wider audience, I shall feel I have been more than repaid for any effort that I have put forth in connection with them. Booker T. Washington, Tuskegee, Alabama. End of Publisher's Explanation and Preface to Character Building. Recording by Luke Sartor, Griffith, New South Wales. Chapter 1 of Character Building. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.
Recording by Luke Sartor Character Building by Booker T. Washington Chapter 1 Two Sides of Life there are quite a number of divisions into which life can be divided, but for the purposes of this evening, I am going to speak of two, the bright side of life and the dark side. In thought, in talk, in action, I think you will find that you can separate life into these two divisions, the dark side and the bright side, the discouraging side and the encouraging side. You will find, too, that there are two classes of people, just as there are two divisions of the subject. There is one class that is schooling itself and constantly training itself to look upon the dark side of life. And there is another class, made up of people who are, consciously or unconsciously, constantly training themselves to look upon the bright side of life. Now it is not wise to go too far in either direction. The person who schools himself to see the dark side of life is likely to make a mistake, and the person who schools himself to look only upon the bright side of life, forgetting all else, also is apt to make a mistake. Notwithstanding this, I think I am right in saying that persons who accomplish the most in this world those to whom, on account of their helpfulness, the world looks most for service, those who are most useful in every way, are those who are constantly seeing and appreciating the bright side as well as the dark side of life. You will sometimes find two persons who get up in the morning, perhaps a morning that is overcast with shadows, a damp, wet, rainy, uninviting morning, and one of these persons will speak of the morning as being gloomy, will speak of the mud puddles about the house, of the rain, and of all of the disagreeable features. The second person, the one who has schooled himself to see the brighter side of life, the beautiful things in life, will speak of the beauties that are in the raindrops, and the freshness of the newly bathed flowers, shrubs, and trees. Notwithstanding the gloomy and generally disconsolate appearance of things, he will find something attractive in the scene out of doors, and will discover something in the gloomy morning that will cheer him. Suppose that you see these two same persons eat their breakfast. Perhaps they will find out that the rolls are bad, but that the coffee is excellent. If the rolls are poor, it is a great deal better in such a case to get into the habit, a habit that you will find pays from every standpoint, of being able to forget how unpalatable they are, and to let your thoughts dwell upon the good and satisfactory coffee. Call the attention of your near neighbour at the table to the excellence of the coffee. What is the result of that kind of schooling? You will grow up to be an individual whom people will like to see coming near them, an individual to whom people will go for encouragement when the hours are dark and when everything seems to be discouraging. In just the same way, when you go into the classrooms to recite your lessons, do not dwell upon any mistakes that you may think you see the teacher make, or upon any weakness in the presentation of the lesson. All teachers make mistakes sometimes, and you may depend upon it that it is an excellent teacher and a person of fine character who, when he or she has made a mistake, says frankly and plainly, I have made a mistake, or... I don't know. It takes a very good and a very bright teacher to say, I don't know. No teacher knows everything about every subject. A good teacher will say frankly and clearly, I don't know. I cannot answer that question. Let me tell you, right here, too, that when you go out from here to become teachers yourselves, as a large proportion of you will go, Whenever you get to a point where a student asks you a question which you are not able to answer, or asks you something about a subject on which you are not well informed, you will find it better to say frankly and honestly, I am unable to answer your question. 
your students will respect you a great deal more for your frankness and honesty. Education is not what a person is able to hold in his head, so much as it is what a person is able to find. I believe it was Daniel Webster who said that the truly educated man was not the one who had all the knowledge in his head, but the one who knew where to look for information upon any subject upon which at any time he might want information. Each individual who wishes to succeed must get that kind of discipline. He must get such training that he will know where to go and get facts, rather than try to train himself to hold all facts in his head. I want you to go out from this institution so trained and so developed that you will be constantly looking for the bright, encouraging and beautiful things in life. It is the weak individual, as a rule, who is constantly calling attention to the other side, to the dark and discouraging things of life. When you go into your classrooms, I repeat, try to forget and overlook any weak points that you may think you see. Remember and dwell upon the consideration that has been given to the lesson, the faithfulness with which it was prepared, and the earnestness with which it is presented. Try to recall and to remember every good thing and every encouraging thing which has come under your observation, whether it has been in the classroom or in the shop or in the field. No matter where you are, seize hold on the encouraging things with which you come in contact. In connection with the personality of their teachers, it is very unfortunate for students to form a habit of continually finding fault of criticizing, of seeing nothing but what the student may think are weak points. Try to get into a frame of mind where you will be constantly seeing and calling attention to the strong and beautiful things which you observe in the life and work of your teachers. Grow into the habit of talking about the bright side of life. When you meet a fellow student, a teacher, or anybody, or when you write letters home, Get into the habit of calling attention to the bright things of life that you have seen, the things that are beautiful, the things that are charming. Just in proportion as you do this, you will find that you will not only influence yourself in the right direction, but that you will also influence others that way. It is a very bad habit to get into, that of being continually moody and discouraged, and of making the atmosphere uncomfortable for everybody who comes within ten feet of you. There are some people who are so constantly looking on the dark side of life that they cannot see anything but that side. Everything that comes from their mouths is unpleasant about this thing and that thing, and they make the whole atmosphere around them unpleasant for themselves and for everybody with whom they come in contact. Such persons are surely undesirable. Why, I have seen people coming up the road who caused me to feel like wanting to cross over on the other side of the way, so as not to meet them. I didn't want to hear their tales of misery and woe. I had heard those tales so many times that I didn't want to get into the atmosphere of the people who told them. It is often very easy to influence others in the wrong direction, and to grow into such a moody, fault-finding disposition that one not only is miserable and unhappy himself, but makes everyone with whom he comes in contact miserable and unhappy. The persons who live constantly in a fault-finding atmosphere, who see only the dark side of life, become negative characters. They are the people who never go forward. They never suggest a line of activity. They live simply on the negative side of life. Now, as students, you cannot afford to grow in that way. We want to send each one of you out from here, not as a negative force, but as a strong, positive, helpful force in the world. You will not accomplish the task which we expect of you if you go with a moody, discouraged, fault-finding disposition. To do the most that lies in you, you must go with a heart and head full of hope and faith in the world, believing that there is work for you to do, 
believing that you are the person to accomplish that work, and the one who is going to accomplish it. In nine cases out of ten, the person who cultivates the habit of looking on the dark side of life is the little person, the miserable person, the one who is weak in mind, heart, and purpose. On the other hand, the person who cultivates the habit of looking on the bright side of life and who calls attention to the beautiful and encouraging things in life, in nine cases out of ten, is the strong individual, the one to whom the world goes for intelligent advice and support. I'm trying to get you to see, as students, the best things in life. Do not be satisfied with second-hand or third-hand things in life. Do not be satisfied until you have put yourselves into that atmosphere where you can seize and hold on to the very highest and most beautiful things that can be got out of life. End of Chapter 1 Two Sides of Life Recording by Luke Sartor Griffith, New South Wales Chapter 2 of Character Building by Booker T. Washington. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Luke Sartor. Chapter 2 Helping Others. There are a few things essential in an institution of this kind that I think it is well for you to keep ever before you. This institution does not exist for your education alone. It does not exist for your comfort and happiness altogether, although those things are important and we keep them in mind. It exists that we may give you intelligence, skill of hand, and strength of mind and heart, and we help you in these ways that you, in turn, may help others. We help you that you may help somebody else, and if you do not do this, when you go out from here, then now work here has been in vain. You would be surprised to know how small a part of your own expenses you pay here. You pay but little, and by reason of that fact it follows that as trustees of the funds which are given to this institution, we have no right to keep an individual here who we do not think is going to be able to go out and help somebody else. We have no right to keep a student here who we do not think is strong enough to go out and be of assistance to somebody else. We are here for the purpose of educating you, that you may become strong, intelligent and helpful. If you are paying the cost of your board here, and for your tuition, and fuel, and lights, then we should have a different problem. But so long as it is true that you pay so small a proportion of your expenses as you do, we must keep in view the fact that we have no right to keep a student here, no matter how much we may sympathise with him or her, unless that student is going to be able to do somebody else some good. Every young man and every young woman should feel that he or she is here on trust, that every day here is a sacred day, that it is a day that belongs to the race. Our graduates and the majority of the students who have gone out from here have ever had an unselfish spirit and have been willing to go out and work at first for small salaries and in uncomfortable places where in a large degree conditions have been discouraging and desolate. We believe that kind of spirit will continue to exist in this institution and that we shall continue to have students who will go out from here to make other persons strong and useful. Now no individual can help another individual unless he himself is strong. You notice that the curriculum here goes along in three directions, along the line of labour, of academic training, and of moral and religious training. We expect those who are here to keep strong and to make themselves efficient in these three directions in each of which you are to learn to be leaders. Some people are able to do a thing when they are directed to do it, but people of that kind are not worth very much. 
There are people in the world who never think, who never map out anything for themselves, who have to wait to be told what to do. People of that kind are not worth anything. They really ought to pay rent for the air they breathe, for they only vitiate it. Now we do not want such people as those here. We want people who are going to think, people who are going to prepare themselves. I noticed an incident this morning. Did you ever hear that side door creak on its hinges before this morning? The janitor ought to have noticed that creaking and put some oil on the hinges without waiting to be told to do it. Then again this morning, I noticed that after it had been raining hard for twenty-four hours, when it was wet and muddy, no provision had been made to protect the hogs at the sty, and they were completely covered with mud. Now the person who had charge of the sty should not have waited for someone to tell him to go down there and put some straw in for bedding, and put boards over the sty to keep the animals dry. No one in charge of the hogs ought to have waited to be told to do a thing like that. The kind of persons we want here are those who are not going to wait for you to tell them to do such things, but who will think of them for themselves and do them. If we cannot turn out a man here who is capable of taking care of a pigsty, how can we expect him to take care of affairs of state? Then again, some of you are expected to take care of the roads. I should have liked to have seen boys this morning so much interested in working on the roads that they would have put sawdust from this building to the gate. I should have liked to see them put down some boards and arrange for the water to drain off. We want such fellows as those here. The ones we want are the ones who are going to think of such things as these without being told. That is the only kind of people worth having. Those who have to wait to have somebody else put ideas into their minds are not worth much of anything. And, to be plain with you, we cannot have such people here. We want you to be thinkers, to be leaders. Yesterday and the night before, I travelled on the Mobile and Ohio Railroad from St. Louis to Montgomery, and there was a young man on the same train who was not more than twenty years old, I believe, who recently had been appointed a special freight agent of the road. All his conversation was about freight. He talked freight to me and to everybody else. He would ask this man and that man if they had any freight, and if so he would tell them that they must have it shipped over the mobile and Ohio railroad. Now that man will be general freight agent of that road some day. He may be president of the road. But suppose he had sat down and gone to sleep, and had waited for someone to come to him to inquire the best way to ship freight. Do you suppose he would ever have secured any freight to ship? Begin to think. If you cannot learn to think, why, you'll be of no use to yourself or anybody else. Every once in a while, about every three months, we have to go through the process of weeding out among the students. We are going to make that weeding out process stricter this year than ever before. We are compelled to get rid of every student here who is weak in mind, weak in morals, or weak in industry. We cannot keep a student here unless he counts for one. You must count one yourself. You eat for one, you drink for one, and you sleep for one. And so you will have to count for one if you are going to stay here. I want you to go out into the world, not to have an easy time, but to make sacrifices and to help somebody else. There are those who need your help and your sacrifice. You may be called upon to sacrifice a great deal. You may have to work for small salaries. You may have to teach school in uncomfortable buildings. You may have to work in desolate places, and the surroundings may be in every way discouraging. And when I speak of your going out into life, I do not confine you to the schoolroom. I believe that those who go out and become farmers and leaders in other directions, as well as teachers, 
are to succeed. The most interesting thing connected with this institution is the magnificent record that our graduates are making. As the institution grows larger, we do not want to lose the spirit of self-sacrifice, the spirit of usefulness which the graduates and the students who have gone out from here have shown. We want you to help somebody else. We want you not to think of yourselves alone. The more you do to make somebody else happy, the more happiness you will receive in turn. If you want to be happy, if you want to live a contented life, if you want to live a life of genuine pleasure, do something for somebody else. When you feel unhappy, disagreeable and miserable, to someone else who is miserable, and to that person an act of kindness, you will find that you will be made happy. The miserable persons in this world are the ones whose hearts are narrow and hard. The happy ones are those who have great big hearts. Such persons are always happy. End of chapter 2 Helping Others Recording by Luke Sartor Griffith, New South Wales Chapter 3 of Character Building This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Luke Sartor Character Building by Booker T. Washington Chapter 3 Some of the Rocks Ahead I feel sure that I can be of some degree of service to you tonight in helping you to anticipate some of the troubles that you are going to meet during the coming year. Do not look for trouble, is a safe maxim to follow, but it is equally safe to prepare for trouble. All of you realize, of course, that where we have so large a machine as we happen to have here, when I speak of machine in this way, you will understand that I refer to the school. It takes some time to get it into perfect order, or anything bordering upon perfect running order. Now, I repeat, it is the wise individual who prepares himself beforehand for the day of difficulties, for the day of discouragements, for the rainy day. It is the wise individual who makes up his mind that life is not going to be all sunshine, that all is not going to be perpetual pleasure. What is true of everyday life is true of school life. There are a number of difficulties which it is probable you are going to meet, or which are going to meet you. I want you to prepare yourselves against these as wisely as you can. In the first place, a great many of you are going to be disappointed, if this has not already been the case, in the classes to which you will be assigned. The average individual thinks he knows a great deal more than he does know. The individual who really knows more than he thinks he knows is very rare indeed. The individual who really knows more than he thinks he knows is very rare indeed. When a student gets to the point where he knows more than he thinks he knows, the student is about ready to leave school. I wish a very large number of you had reached that point. I repeat, numbers of you are going to be disappointed during the year as to the classes to which you are going to be assigned. Now I want to give you this advice before you go to an institution. Examine the catalogue of that school. The catalogue will give you all the information about the school. Then make up your mind whether or not you have faith in that institution. Find out if it is the school you wish to attend, and then decide if you have faith enough in it to become its pupil. Then if you have once done this, make up your mind that those who are placed over you as your teachers have had more experience than you can have had, and that they are therefore able to advise you as to your classes. Make up your mind 
but if you are asked to go into a lower class than you think your ability entitles you to go into you are going to follow the advice and instruction of the people who are older than you and who have more education than you have another way in which you are going to be disappointed and be made homesick perhaps if you have not already so is in the rooms to which you are going to be assigned you are going to get rooms that you do not like they will not be perhaps as attractive as you desire or they will be too crowded you are going to be given persons for roommates with whom you think it is going to be impossible to get along pleasantly people who are not congenial to you during the hot months your rooms are going to be too hot and during the cold months they are going to be too cold you are going to meet with all these difficulties in your rooms make up your mind that you are going to conquer them i have often said that the students who in the early years of this school had such hard times with their rooms have succeeded grandly many of you now live in palaces compared to the rooms which those students had i am sure that the students who attend this school find that the institution is better fitted every year to take care of them than it was the year previous from year to year there has been a steady growth in accommodations and that is all that we can wish or expect from year to year we do not forget that it is our duty to make students more comfortable than in previous years and we are steadily growing in that direction but notwithstanding all this we cannot do all that we want to do make up your minds then that you are going to find difficulties in your room in reference to your roommates the heat the cold and any number of things that concern your stay in the buildings but in all these matters keep in mind the high purpose for which you came here to get an education get that thought into your heart and body and it will enable you to be the master of all these little things all these minor and temporary obstacles many of you are going to be disappointed in regard to your food notwithstanding all the care we may try to take and want to take many of you are going to be disappointed in this respect but how little is the meaning of one meal how little a thing is being inconvenienced by one meal as compared with something that is going to be a part of you all the remainder of your lives it is not for the food the room or the minor things that you have come here it is to get something into your minds and hearts that will make you better that will stand by you and hold you up and make you useful all through life some of you are going to find it difficult to obey orders sometimes orders will be given you which you think are wrong and unjust perhaps orders will be given you sometimes that really are unjust in that respect no institution is perfect but i want to learn this lesson in respect to orders that it is always best to learn to obey orders and respect authority that it is better ten times over for you to obey an order that you know is wrong and which perhaps was given you in a wrong spirit or with a mistaken motive it is better for you to obey even such an order as that than it is for any individual to get into the habit of disobeying and not respecting those in authority make up your mind that if you want to add to your happiness and strength of character you are before all things else going to learn to obey if it should happen that for a minute or five minutes one of your fellow students is placed in authority over you that student's commands should be sacred you should obey his commands just as quickly as you would obey those of the highest officer in this institution learn that it is no disgrace to obey those in authority one of the highest and surest signs of civilization is that a people have learned to obey the commands of those who are placed over them i want to add here that it is to the credit of this institution that with very few exceptions the students have always been ready and willing to respect authority 
I want you to see, as I think you will see, that having a hard time, running up against difficulties here and there, helps to make an individual strong and also helps to make him powerful. This is the point I want to make with you, that one of the reasons you are here is that you may learn to overcome difficulties. I have named some that you may expect to meet, but I have not named them all. They will keep springing up all the time. Just in proportion as you learn to rise above them and trample them under your feet, just in that proportion will you accomplish the high purpose for which you came here and help to accomplish the purpose for which this institution exists. End of chapter 3 Some of the Rocks Ahead Recording by Luke Sartor Griffith, New South Wales Chapter 4 of Character Building by Booker T. Washington This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Luke Sartor Chapter 4 On Influencing by Example A few evenings ago, while in Cincinnati, I was very pleasantly surprised, after speaking at a large meeting, to be invited by a company of young coloured men to attend for a few minutes a reception at their club room. I expected when I went to the place designated to find a number of young men who, perhaps, had hired a room and fitted it up for the purpose of gratifying their own selfish pleasures. I found that this was not the case. Instead, I found fifteen young men whose ages ranged from eighteen to twenty years who had banded themselves together in a club known as the Winona Club, for the purpose of improving themselves, and, further, for the purpose, as far as possible, of getting hold of other young coloured men in the city who were inclined in the wrong direction. I found a room beautifully fitted up, with a carpet on the floor, with beautiful pictures upon the walls, with books and pictures in their little library, and with fifteen of the brightest, most honest, and cleanest-looking young men that it has been my pleasure to meet for a long time. It was a very pleasant surprise to find these young men, especially in the midst of the temptations of a northern city, in the midst of evil surroundings, banded together for influencing others in the right direction. These young men came together, and at their first meeting said that they were going to band themselves together for the purpose of improving themselves and helping others. They said that the first article in their constitution should be to the effect that there should be no gambling in that club, that there must be no strong drink allowed in that club, and that there should be nothing there that was not in keeping with the life of a true and high-minded gentleman. I repeat that it was very pleasant and encouraging for me to find such work as this going on in Cincinnati. What was equally gratifying, and surprising, was that at the close of the reception they presented me with a neat sum of money which they had collected, and asked that this money be used to defray the expenses to some student at the school here. Now the point I especially want to make tonight is this. All of you must bear in mind the fact that you are not only to keep yourselves clean and pure and sober and true in every respect, but you owe a constant responsibility to yourself to see that you exert a helpful influence on others also. A large proportion of you are to go from here into great cities. Some of you will go into such cities as Montgomery, and some, perhaps, will go into the cities of the north, although I hope that the most of you will see your way clear to remain in the south. I believe that you will do better to remain in the country districts than to go into the cities. I believe that you will find it to your advantage, in every way, to try to live in a small town or in a country district, rather than in a city. I believe that we are at our best in country life, in agricultural life, and too often at our worst in city life. 
now when you go out into the world for yourselves you must remember in the first place that you cannot hold yourselves up unless you keep engaged and out of idleness no idle person is ever safe whether he be rich or poor make up your minds whether you are to live in the city or in the country that you are going to be constantly employed in a rich and prosperous country like america there is absolutely no excuse for persons living in idleness i have little patience with persons who go around whining that they cannot find anything to do especially is this true in the south where the soil is cheap there is little or no excuse for any man or woman going about complaining that he or she cannot find work you cannot set proper examples unless you yourself are constantly employed see to it then whether you live in a city a town or in a country district that you are constantly employed when you are not engaged in the proper kind of recreation or in rest unless you do this you will find that you will go down as thousands of our young men have gone down as thousands of our young men are constantly going down who yield to the temptations which beset them refrain from staking your earnings upon games of chance see to it that you pass by those things which tend to your degradation teach this to others teach those with whom you come in contact that they cannot lead strong moral lives unless they keep away from the gambling table see to it that you regulate your life properly that you regulate your hours of sleep have the proper kinds of recreation quite a number of our young men in the cities stay up until twelve one or two o'clock each night sometimes they are at a dance and sometimes at the gambling table or in some brothel or drinking in some saloon as a result they go late to their work and in a short time you hear them complaining about having lost their positions they will tell you that they have lost their jobs on account of race prejudice or because their former employers are not going to hire coloured help any longer but you will find if you learn the real circumstances that it is much more likely that they have lost their jobs because they were not punctual or on account of carelessness then too you will find that you will go down if you yield to the temptation of indulging in strong drink that is a thing that is carrying a great many of our young men down i do not say that all of our men are of this class or that all of them yield to temptations but i can go into many of the large cities and find just such men as those in cincinnati to whom i have referred you cannot hope to succeed if you keep bad company as far as possible try to form the habit of spending your nights at home there is nothing worse for a young man or young woman than to get into the habit of thinking that he or she must spend every night on the street or in some public place i want you as you go out from this institution whether you are graduates or not whether you have been here one year or four years to go out with the idea that you must set a high example for everyone in your community you must remember that the people are watching you every day if you yield to the temptation of strong drink of going into bad company others will do the same thing they will shape their lives after yours you must so shape your lives that the hundreds and thousands of those who are looking to you for guidance may profit by your example end of chapter four on influencing by example recording by luke sartor griffith new south wales chapter five of character building this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by luke sartor character building by booker t washington chapter five the virtue of simplicity 
I hope that you all paid strict attention to what Mr. William H. Baldwin, Jr., who recently spoke to you, had to say. In the few words that he spoke, I think he told you the platform upon which this institution has been built. You will remember that he laid a great deal of stress upon the importance of the institution remaining simple, of keeping that degree of simplicity and thoroughness that it has always possessed. It is true that in the last few months the institution has come into a great deal of prominence and is meeting with what the world calls success. But we must remember that very often it is with institutions as it is with individuals. Success may injure them more than poverty. Now, this institution will continue to succeed. Will continue to have the good will and confidence, the cooperation of the best and wisest and most generous people in the country, just so long as its faculty, its students, and all connected with it remain simple, earnest, and thorough. Just as soon as in any department there are indications that we are beginning to become what the world calls stuck up, just so soon will the people lose confidence in us and will fail to support us, and just so soon will the institution begin to decay. We will grow in buildings, in industries, in apparatus, in the number of teachers and of students, and in the confidence of the people, just in proportion as we do what the institution has set out to do, that is, teach young men and women how to live simple, plain, and honourable lives by learning how to do something uncommonly well. When I speak of humbleness and simplicity, I do not mean that it is necessary for us to lose sight of what the world calls manhood and womanhood, that it is necessary to be cringing and unmanly, but you will find in the long run that the people who have the greatest influence in the world are the humble and simple ones. Now we must not only remain humble, but we must be very sure that whatever is done in every department of the school is thoroughly done. Any institution runs a great risk when it begins to grow, to grow larger in numbers or larger in any respect. It can succeed then only in proportion as those who have responsibilities are conscientious in the highest degree. We can succeed in putting up good buildings only in proportion as everyone performs well his part in the erection of each building. We can succeed only in proportion as the student who makes the mortar, who lays the bricks, puts his whole conscience into that work and does it just as thoroughly as it is possible for him to do it. If he is mixing mortar, he must do it just as well as he can, and then, tomorrow, must do it still better than he did it today, and the next week better than he did it this week. The student who lays the bricks must learn to lay each brick as well as it is possible for him to lay it, and then do still better work on the morrow. We must remember, too, that we have a certain amount of responsibility to care for our buildings, and that a great deal of interest should be taken not only in putting up all our buildings thoroughly, but in looking out for their preservation as well. We must see to it that the buildings which the students have worked so hard to erect, and which generous friends have so kindly enabled us to secure, are not marred in any way. You must make new students know that this property is yours, and that every building here is yours. No student has any right to mar in any way what you have worked so hard to erect, and your friends have been generous enough to provide. If you find a student drawing a lead pencil across a piece of plastering which you have put on, you must let that student know that he is destroying what you have worked hard to create, and that when he destroys that building, he is destroying something which students yet to come should have the opportunity of enjoying. We want to be sure that in every industry, in every department of the institution, there is simplicity, humbleness, and thoroughness. 
whatever is entrusted to you to do in the industrial departments in the classrooms be sure that you put your whole heart into that thing we do not expect to have fine costly buildings nor do we want to have them but we do expect to have well constructed buildings and attractive buildings and if we can go on in this simple humble way the time will come when we shall have all the buildings we need just in proportion as our friends see that we are worthy of these good things they will come to us we want to be sure that in no department is there any wastefulness we must try to make every dollar go as far as possible we must stretch a dollar as i have heard mr boardman say until it can be stretched no further now there will be waste unless we put our conscience into everything that we do there will be waste in the boarding department in the academic department in the industrial department in the religious department in all the departments about us unless we put our conscience into everything that we do let us be sure that not a single dollar that is given to us is wasted because the same people who give to us are called upon almost every day in the week each year to give for hundreds of purposes and they have to choose which they will support they must decide whether they want to give to this cause or to that cause and they will give to us if we make them feel that we are more worthy than other similar institutions we want also to be sure that we remain simple in our dress and in all our outward appearance i do not like to see a young man who is poor and whose tuition is being paid by someone and who has no books sometimes has no socks sometimes has no decent shoes wearing a white stiff shining collar which he has sent away to be laundered i do not like to ask people to give money for such a young man as that it is much better for a young man to learn to launder his collars himself than to pretend to the world that he is what he is not when you send a collar to the city laundry it indicates that you have a bank account it indicates that you have money ahead and can afford that luxury now i do not believe that you can afford it and that kind of pretense and that kind of acting do not pay get right down to business and as i have said if we cannot do up your collars well enough here to suit you why get some soap and water and starch and an iron and learn to launder your own collars and keep on laundering them until you can do them better than anybody else i am not trying to discourage you about wearing nice collars i like to see every collar shine i like to see every collar as bright as possible i like to see you wear good attractive collars i do not however want you to get the idea that collars make the man you quite often see fine cuffs and collars when there is no real man there you want to be sure to get the man first be sure that the man is there and if he is the collars and the cuffs will come in due time if there is no man there we may put on all the collars and cuffs we can get and we shall find that they will not make the man when you have finished school after you have gone out and established yourselves in some kind of business after you have learned to save money and have gotten a good bank account ahead if you are aware the laundering is not sufficiently well done to suit you why perhaps you can afford to send your collars forty or fifty miles away but as i see you young men i do not believe you can afford it and if you can afford it why i should like to have you pay that money for a part of your tuition which we now have to get someone else to pay for you you want to be very sure too that as you go out into the world you go out not ashamed to work not ashamed to put in practice what you have learned here as i come in contact with our graduates i am very glad to be able to say that in almost no instance have i found a student who has been at tuskegee long enough to learn the ways of the institution 
or a graduate who has been ashamed to use his hands. Now that reputation we want to keep up. We want to be sure that such a reputation as this, we want to be sure that such a reputation as this follows every student who goes out. And then be very sure that you are simple in your words and your language. Write your letters in the simplest and plainest manner possible. Who of you did not understand what was said by Mr. John D. Rockefeller, Jr., when he spoke from this platform a few evenings ago? Was there a single word or a single reference or figure of speech that he used that he did not understand the full force of or did not appreciate? Here is a man whose father is perhaps the richest man in the world, and yet there was no tomfoolery about his speech. Every word was simple and plain, and everybody could understand everything that he said. He used no Latin or Greek quotations. Some people get the idea that if they can get a little education and a little money ahead and can talk so that no one can understand them, they are educated. That is a great mistake, because nobody understands them, and they do not understand themselves. Now, the world has no sympathy with that kind of thing. If you have anything to write, write it in the plainest manner possible. Use just as few words as possible and as simple words as possible. If you can get a word with one syllable that will express your meaning, use it in preference to one of two syllables. If you cannot get a suitable word of one syllable, try to get one of two syllables instead of three or four. At any rate, make your words just as short as possible, and your sentences as short and simple as you can make them. There is great power in simplicity. Simplicity of speech, simplicity of life in every form. The world has no patience with people who are superficial, who are trying to show off, who are trying to be what the world knows they are not. You know you sometimes get frightened and discouraged about the laws that some of the states are inclined to pass, and that some of them are passing. But there is no state, there is no municipality, there is no power on earth that can neutralize the influence of a high, pure, simple and useful life. Every individual who learns to live such a life will find an opportunity to make his influence felt. No one can in any way permanently hold back a race of people who are getting those elements of strength which the world recognizes, which the world has always recognized and which it always will recognize as indicating the highest type of manhood and womanhood. There is nothing, then, to be discouraged about. We are going forward, and we shall keep going forward if we do not let these difficulties, which sometimes occur, discourage us. You will find that every man and every woman who is worthy to be respected and praised and recognized will be respected and praised and recognized. End of chapter 5. Recording by Luke Sartor, Griffith, New South Wales. Chapter 6 of Character Building. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Luke Sartor. Character Building by Booker T. Washington. Chapter 6. Have You Done Your Best? This talk was given at the middle of the school year. If you have not already done so, and I hope you have, I think that you will find this a convenient season for each one of you to stop and to consider your school year very carefully, to consider your life in school from every point of view, to place yourselves, as it were, in the presence of your parents or your friends at home, to place yourselves in the presence of those who stand by and support this institution, to place yourselves in the presence of your teachers and of all who are in any way interested in you. 
Now, suppose you were tonight sitting down by your parents' side, by their fireside, looking them in the face, or by the side of your nearest and dearest friends, those who have done the most for you, those who have stood by you most closely. Suppose you are in that position. I want to ask you to answer this question. In considering your school life, in your studies, for example, during the year thus far, have you done your best? Have you been really honest with your parents, who have struggled, who have sacrificed, who have toiled for years in ways you do not know of, in order that you might come here, and in order that you might remain here? Have you really been interested in them? Have you really been honest with your teachers? Have you been honest with those who support this institution? Have you really, in a word, in the preparation and recitation of your lessons, done your level best? Right out from your hearts, have you done your best? I fear that a great many of you, when you look your conscience squarely in the face, when you get right down to your real selves, at the bottom of your lives, must answer that you have not done your best. There have been precious minutes, there have been precious hours, that you have completely thrown away, hours for which you cannot show a single return. Now if you have not done your level best, right out straight from your heart, in the preparation and recitation of your lessons, and in all your work, it is not too late for you to make amends. I should be very sorry if I waited until the end of the term to remind you of this, because it would then be too late. There would be many of you with long faces who would say, if you were reminded then, that you could have done so much better, would have been so much more honest with your parents and friends if you had only been reminded earlier, and that in every way you would have made your lives so different from what they had been. Now it isn't too late. Grant, as I know that numbers of you will grant, that you have thrown away precious time, that you have been indifferent to the advice of your teachers, that you really haven't been honest with yourselves in the preparation of your lessons, that you have been careless in your recitations. I want you to be really honest with yourselves and say from tonight on, I am going to take charge of myself. I am not going to drift in this respect. I am going to row up the stream, and my life, as a schoolboy or a schoolgirl, is going to be different from what it has been. Now place yourselves again in the presence of your parents, of those who are dearest to you, and answer this question. In your work, in your industrial work here, have you done your real best? In the field and in the shop, with the plough, the trowel, the hammer, the saw, have you done your level best? Have you done your best in the sewing room and in the cooking classes? Have you justified your parents in the sacrifice of time and money which they have made in order to allow you to come here? If you haven't done your best in these respects, and many of you haven't, there is still time for you to become a different man or woman. It isn't too late. You can turn yourselves completely around. Those of you who have been indifferent and slow, those of you who have been thoughtless and slovenly, those of you who have tried to find out how little effort of body or mind you could put into your industrial work here, it isn't too late for you to turn yourselves completely around in that respect and to say that from tonight you are going to be a different man or woman. Have you done your level best in making your surroundings what the school requires, what your school life should be, in learning how to take care of your bodies, in learning how to keep your bodies clean and pure, in the conscientious, systematic use of the toothbrush? Have you done your best? Have you been downright honest in that respect alone? Have you used the toothbrush just because you felt it was a requirement of the school, 
or because you felt that you could not be clean or honest with your roommates, that you could not be yourself in the sight of God unless you used the toothbrush? Have you used it in the dark as well as in the light? Have you learned that, even if your room was not going to be inspected on a certain day, it was just as important that you learn the lesson of being conscientious about keeping it in order as if you knew it was going to be inspected. Have you been careful in this respect? Have you shifted this duty or neglected that duty? Have you thrown some task off onto your roommates? Have you tried to slide out of it, or, as it were, to get by, as the slang phrase goes, without doing really honest straightforward work as regards the cleanliness of your room the improvement of it the making of it more attractive have you been really honest with yourselves and your parents with those who spend so much money for the support of this institution above all have you been really true to your parents and to your best selves in growing in strength of character in strength of purpose in being downright honest. Those of you who came here, for instance, with the habit of telling falsehoods, of deceiving in one way or another, those of you who came here with the temptation, perhaps, in too many cases, overshadowing you and overpowering you, to take property which does not belong to you, have you been really honest in overcoming habits of this kind? Are you building character? Are you less willing to yield to temptation? Are you more able to overcome temptation now than you were? If you are not more able, you have not grown in this respect. But it is not too late. If there are some of you who have been unfortunate enough to allow little mean habits, mean dispositions, mean acts, mean thoughts, mean words, to get the uppermost of you? In a word, if your life thus far has been a little dried up, narrow life, get rid of that life. Throw open your heart. Say now, I am not going to be conquered by little mean thoughts, words and acts any longer. Hereafter, all my thoughts, all my words, all my acts shall be large, generous, high, pure. In a word, I want you to get hold of this idea, that you can make the future of your lives just what you want to make it. You can make it bright, happy, useful, if you learn this fundamental lesson and stick to it while in school, or after you go away from here, that it doesn't pay any individual to do any less than his very best doesn't pay to be anything else but downright honest in heart. Any person who is not honest, who is not trying to do his very best in the classroom or in the shop, no matter where he may be, will find out that it does not pay in the long run. You may think it best for a little while, but permanently it does not pay any man or woman to be anything but really downright honest and to do his or her level best. Now I want you to think about these things, not only here in the chapel tonight, but tomorrow in your classrooms, and with reference to everything you touch. I want to see you let it shine out, even at the very ends of your fingers, that you are doing your best in everything. Do this, and you will find that at the end of the year that you are growing stronger, purer, and brighter, that you are making your parents and those interested in you happier, and that you are preparing yourselves to do what this institution and the country expect you to do. End of chapter 6 Have you done your best? Recording by Luke Sartor, Griffith, New South Wales. Chapter 7 of Character Building 
by Booker T. Washington. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Luke Sartor. Character Building by Booker T. Washington. Chapter 7 Don't Be Discouraged. Last Sunday evening I spoke to you for a few minutes regarding the importance of determining to do the right thing in every phase of your school life. There are a few things that enter into student life which, in a very large degree, cause the untrue to fall by the wayside, and which prevent students from doing their very best. Among these things is the disposition to grow discouraged. Very many people, very many students, who otherwise would succeed, who would go through school creditably, graduating with honours, have failed to succeed because they became discouraged. Now there are a number of things in school life that cause a student to become discouraged, and I am going to try to enumerate a few of them, although I do not know that I shall mention nearly all of them. Students frequently become discouraged on account of their industrial work. It is not of the character that they want it to be, or they do not get assigned to the trade they want to work at. Still others become discouraged because of their classroom studies. They find that their studies are difficult, that their lessons are too long, and their memories too short. They find that they cannot understand the teacher, or they think they find that the teacher does not understand them. Some become discouraged because they think that they are entirely misunderstood, are misunderstood by their classmates and by their teachers. They think that their efforts in the classroom and in the shop are not properly appreciated. Others become discouraged because they feel that they are without friends. It seems to them that other students have friends on every hand who are encouraging them, who send them money who supply them with clothing, and that they themselves have no such friends. You become discouraged for such reasons as these. You feel that your highest and best efforts are not appreciated. This tends to discourage you. There are not a few of you who get discouraged because you feel that you belong to a despised race, that for a long time you have been trampled upon because of your colour and because of certain peculiar characteristics that you have been neglected or oppressed, and that there is no reason why you should make an effort to go forward, that you belong to a race that is doomed to disappointment, to stay under, and to not succeed. Some of you become discouraged and despondent because of poverty. Perhaps here I strike the basis of the reason for most of the discouragement. You come here, and your parents disappoint you. They do not supply you with money. You become discouraged because they do not supply you with proper clothing or with what you think you ought to have, and, very often, with such as you really ought to have, and that disheartens you. You find that other students have money, and you have none. They have money not only for the necessities of school life, but for some of the luxuries, while you have not enough for even the bare necessities. Other students are more than supplied with clothing, while you are very scantily supplied. You shiver, in many cases, by reason of the cold, while others are comfortable and nicely dressed. Sometimes you are even ashamed to show yourself in public because of the appearance of the old coat or trousers or shoes that you have to wear. Some of you become discouraged because you find yourselves without the proper books. Some of you cannot get the money needed to purchase books, a toothbrush, and other necessary things. You find yourselves cramped and hampered on every hand. You are discouraged at this point and at that point, 
and you feel that nobody's lot is as hard as your own. You become discouraged, you become dissatisfied, and you feel like giving up. Now I want to suggest to you tonight that this very thing of discouragement, as an element in life, is for a purpose. I do not believe that anything, any element of your lives, is put into them without a purpose. I believe that every effort that we are obliged to make to overcome obstacles will give us strength and will also give us a confidence in ourselves that nothing else can give us. I would ten times rather see you having a hard struggle to elevate yourselves, having a hard time either at work on the farm or on the buildings or in the shops, without money and without clothes, than to see you here having too much money and having everything that you want come to you without any effort on your part. You are blessed, as compared with some people. The man or woman who has money, without having had to work for it, who has all the comforts of life, without effort, and who saves his own soul and perhaps the soul of somebody else, such an individual is rare, very rare indeed. Now it is not a curse to be situated as some of you are, and if you will make up your minds that you are going to overcome the obstacles and the difficulties by which you are surrounded, you will find that in every effort you make to overcome these difficulties, you are growing in strength and confidence. Make up your minds that you are not going to allow anything to discourage you. Make up your minds that poor lessons, scoldings on the part of your teachers, want of money and want of books, that none of these shall discourage you. Make up your mind that in spite of race and colour, in spite of the obstacles that surround you, in spite of everything, you are going to succeed in your school life and are going to prepare yourself for usefulness hereafter. Every person who has grown to any degree of usefulness, every person who has grown to distinction, almost without exception, has been a person who has risen by overcoming obstacles by removing difficulties, by resolving that when he met discouragements, he would not give up. Make up your minds that you are going to overcome every discouragement and that you are not going to let any discouragement overcome you. Those of you who have been inclined to be moody and morose, or have been inclined to feel that the whole world is against you, that there is no use for you to try to elevate yourselves. Make up your minds that your future is just as bright as that of anybody else. Do this, and you will find that you have it in your power to make your future bright or gloomy, just as you desire. End of Chapter 7 Don't Be Discouraged Recording by Luke Sartor Griffith, New South Wales. Chapter 8 of Character Building by Booker T. Washington. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 8 of Character Building On Getting a Home Every colored man owes it to himself and to his children as well to secure a home just as soon as possible. No matter how small the plot of ground may be or how humble the dwelling place on it, something that can be called a home should be secured without delay a home can be secured much easier than many imagine. A small amount of money saved from week to week or from month to month and carefully invested in a piece of land will soon secure a site upon which to build a comfortable house. No individual should feel satisfied until he has a comfortable home. More and more the southern states are making one of the conditions for voting 
the ownership of at least three hundred dollars worth of property so that persons who own homes will not only reap the benefits that come from owning a home in other directions but will also find themselves entitled to cast their ballot care should be taken as to the location of the land it is of little advantage to secure a lot in some crowded filthy alley one should try to secure a lot on a good street a street that is carefully and well worked so that the surroundings of the home will be enjoyable even if one has to go a good ways into the country to secure such a lot it is much better than to buy a building spot on an unsightly undesirable alley i believe that our people do best as a rule to buy land in the country instead of in the city but in either case we should not rest until we have secured a home in one place or the other no man has a right to marry and run the risk of leaving his wife at his death without a home i notice with regret that there are many of our people who have already bought homes who after they have secured the land paid for it and built a cabin containing two or three rooms do not seek to go any further in the improvement of the property in the first place in too many cases the house and yard especially the yard are not kept clean the fences are not kept in repair whitewash and paint are not used as they should be no matter if the house is paid for the greatest care should be exercised to see that it is kept in first-class repair that the walls of the house and the fences are kept neatly painted or whitewashed that no palings are allowed to fall off the fence or if they do fall off to remain off if there is a barn or a hen house these should be kept in repair and should like the house be made to look neat and attractive by paint and whitewash paint and whitewash add a great deal to the value of a house if persons would learn to use even a part of the time they spend in idle gossip or in standing about on the streets in whitewashing or painting their houses it would make a great difference in the appearance of the buildings as well as add to their value only a short time ago near a certain town i visited the house i could not call it a home of a presiding elder a man who had received considerable education and who spent his time in going about over his district preaching to hundreds and thousands of coloured people and yet the home of this man was almost a disgrace to him and to his race the house was not painted or whitewashed the fence was in the same condition the yard was full of weeds there were no walks laid out in the yard there were no flowers in it in fact everything on the outside of the house and in the yard presented a most dismal and discouraging appearance so far as i could see there was not a single vegetable around this house nor did i see any chickens or fowls of any kind this is not the way to live and especially is it not the way for a minister or a teacher to live for they are men who are supposed to lead their people not only by word but by example every minister and every teacher should make his home his yard and his garden models for the people whom he attempts to teach and lead i confess that i have no confidence in the preaching of a minister whose home is in the condition of the one i have described there is no need why as a race we should get into the miserable and unfortunate habit of living in houses that are of repair that are not whitewashed or painted that are not comfortable and above else in houses that we do not own there is no reason why we should not make our homes not only comfortable but attractive so that no one can tell from the outside appearance at least whether the house is occupied by a white family or a black family after a house has been paid for it not only should be improved from year to year and kept in good repair but as the family grows new rooms should be added the house should not only be made comfortable 
but should be made convenient. As soon as possible, there should be a sitting room where books and papers can be found, a room in which the whole family may read and study during the winter nights. I do not believe that any house is complete without a bathroom. As soon as possible, every one of our houses should be provided with a bathroom, so that the body of every member of the family can be baptized every morning in clean, invigorating, fresh water. Such a bath puts one in proper condition for the work of the day, and not only keeps one well physically, but strong morally and religiously. Another important part of the home is the dining room. The dining room should be the most attractive and most comfortable room in the house. It should be large and airy, a room into which plenty of sunlight can come, and a room that can be kept comfortable both in the summer and in the winter. These suggestions are made to you with the hope that you will put them into practice, and also that you will influence others to do the same. They are all suggestions that we, as a race, notwithstanding our poverty, in most cases can find a way to put into practice. Every one of them should be taken up by our teachers, our ministers, and by our educated young people. They should be taught and urged in school, in church, in farmers' meetings, in women's meetings, and, in fact, wherever the people of the race come together. End of chapter 8 On Getting a Home Recording by Luke Sartor Griffith, New South Wales Chapter 9 of Character Building. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Character Building by Booker T. Washington. Chapter 9 Calling Things by Their Right Names. A few evenings ago, I talked with you about the importance of learning to be simple, humble, and childlike before going out into the world. You should remain in school until you get to the point where you feel that you do not know anything, where you feel that you are willing to learn from anyone who can teach you. Unfortunately, there are many things here in the South which tends to lead away from this simplicity to which I have referred. There is a great inclination to make things appear what they are not. For example, take the schools. There is a great tendency to call schools by names which do not belong to them, and which do not correctly represent that which in reality exists. You will find the habit growing more prevalent every year, I fear, of calling a school a university, or a college, or an academy, or a high school. In fact, we seldom hear of a plain, common, public or graded school. We do ourselves no good when we yield to that temptation. If a school is a public school, call it one. But do not think that we gain anything by calling a little country school with two or three rooms and one or two teachers, where some of the students are studying the alphabet, a university. And still this is too often done throughout the South, as you know. No respect or confidence is gained by the practice, but, on the contrary, sensible people get disgusted with such false pretenses. When you go out into the world and meet with such cases as this, try to make the people see that it is a great deal better to call their small public school by a name which truly represents it than to call it a high school or an academy. I do not by any means intend to say that schools do not have the right to aspire to become high schools or colleges. What I mean to say is that it is hurtful to the race to get into the habit of calling every little institution of learning that is opened a college or a university. It weakens us and prevents us from getting a solid, sure foundation. Again, we make the same mistake when we call every preacher or person who stands in a pulpit to read from it, 
doctor, whether or not that degree has been conferred upon him. Sensible people get tired of that kind of thing. The degree of doctor of divinity was once held in the highest esteem and was conferred only upon those ministers who had really become entitled to it because of some original research or other work of high scholarship. Among highly educated people, this rule holds still. But today, especially in the South, many a little institution that opens its doors and calls itself a college or a university is beginning to confer degrees and make doctors of divinity of persons who are unworthy of degrees. And sometimes, should these persons fail to get an institution to confer a degree on them, they confer it on themselves. The habit is getting to be so common that in little towns the ministers are calling themselves doctors. One pastor will meet another and say, Good morning, doctor. And the other, wishing to be as polite as his friend, will say, How are you, doctor? And so it goes on, until both begin to believe they really are doctors. Now this practice is not only ridiculous, but it is very hurtful to us as a race, and it should be discouraged. Much the same criticism may be made of many of those who teach. A person who teaches a little country school, perhaps in a brush arbor, is called professor. Every person who leads a string band is called professor. I was in a small town not long ago, and I heard the people speaking of someone as the professor. I was anxious to know who the professor was, so I waited a few minutes, and finally the professor came up, and I recognized him as a member of one of our preparatory classes. Now don't suffer the world to put you in this silly, ridiculous position. If people attempt to call you professor, or by any other title that is not yours, tell them that you are not a professor, that you are a simple mister. That is a good enough title for anyone. We have the same right to become professors as any other people when we occupy positions which entitle us to that name. But we drag that title, which ought to be a badge of scholarship, down into the mud and mire when we allow it to be misapplied. We carry a similar kind of deception into our school work when, in the essays which we read and the orations which we deliver, we simply rehearse matter, a great deal of which has been copied from someone else. Go into almost any church where there is one of the doctors of divinity to whom I have referred, and you will hear sermons copied out of books and pamphlets. The essays, the orations, the sermons that are not the productions of the people who pretend to write them all come from this false foundation. Then there is another error to which I wish to call your attention. In many parts of the South, especially in the cities and towns, there are excellent public schools, well equipped in every way with apparatus and material, and provided with good, competent teachers. But in some cases these schools are crippled by reason of the fact that there are little denominational schools which deprive the public schools of their rightful attendance. If the schools can't be in the church of some particular denomination, it must be near it. In the average town, there may be the denominational school of the United Methodist Episcopal Church, of the Zion Church, of the Baptist Church, of the Wesleyan Methodist Church, and so on, all in different parts of the town. Instead of supporting one public school, provided at the expense of the town or city, there exists this little, narrow, denominational spirit which is robbing these innocent children of their education. We want to say to such people as these, people who are content so to deprive their children and have them taught by some second-rate teacher, that they are wrong. We want you to let the people know that the great public school system of America is the nation's greatest glory, and that we do not help matters when we attempt to tear down the public school. Of course, it is the right and the duty of every denomination to erect its own theological seminaries and its colleges, where the special tenets of that denomination are taught to those who are preparing for its pulpit. 
but no one has a right to let this denominational spirit defeat the work of a public school to which all should be free to go i have in mind a place where the coloured people have an excellent school equal to that of the whites i went through the building and found it supplied with unproved apparatus and capable teachers and saw that first-class work was done there later i was taken about a mile outside the city where there was a school with all incapable teachers and some sixty or seventy pupils being poorly taught he was a third-rate teacher in a third-rate building poor work and the children suffering for lack of proper instruction why this was simply because the people wanted a school of their own denomination in that part of the city now you want to cultivate courage and see to it that you are brave enough to condemn these wrongs and to show the people the mistakes which they make in these matters i mention all these things because they hinder us from getting a solid foundation they hinder us further in that in many cases they prevent us from getting the right power of leadership in teaching in the work of the ministry and in many other respects wherever you go then make up your minds that you are going to make your influence felt in favour of better prepared teachers and preachers in better preparation of all of those who stand for leaders of the people just in proportion as you set your lives right in this matter will the masses of the race be inclined to follow you end of chapter nine calling things by their right names recording by luke sartor griffith new south wales chapter ten of character building this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by luke sartor character building by booker t washington chapter ten european impressions some people here in america think that some of us make too much ado over the matter of industrial training for the negro i wish some of the sceptics might go to europe and see what races that are years ahead of us are doing there in that respect i shall not take the time here to outline what is being done for men in the direction of industrial training in europe but i shall give some account of what i saw being done for women in england mrs washington and i visited the agricultural college for women at swainley england where we found forty intelligent cultivated women who were most of them graduates from high schools and colleges engaged in studying practical agriculture horticulture dairying and poultry raising we found the women in the laboratory and classrooms studying agricultural chemistry botany zoology and applied mathematics and we also saw these same women in the garden planting vegetables trimming rose bushes scattering manure growing grapes and raising fruit in the hothouses and in the field as another suggestion for our people i might mention that while i was in england i knew one of the leading members of parliament leaving his duties in that body for three days to preside at a meeting of the national association of poultry raisers which was largely attended by people from all parts of the united kingdom in the trip which mrs washington and i made through holland we saw much which may be of interest to you it has been said that god made the world but the dutch made holland for one to fully realize the force of this one must see holland for himself one of the best ways to see the interior of holland in the peasant life is to take a trip as we did on one of the canal boats plying between antwerp in belgium and rotterdam in holland it was especially interesting 
for me to compare the rural life in Holland with the life of the country coloured people in the South. Holland has been made what it is very largely by the unique system of dikes or levees which have been built there to keep out the water of the ocean, and thus enable the people to use to advantage all the land there is in that small country. The great lesson which our coloured farmers can learn from the Dutch is how to make a living from a small plot of ground well cultivated, instead of from forty or fifty acres poorly tilled. I have seen a whole family making a comfortable living by cultivating two acres of land there, while our southern farmers, in too many cases, try to till fifty or a hundred acres and find themselves in debt at the end of the year. In all Holland, I do not think one can find a hundred acres of waste land. Every foot of land is covered with grass, vegetables and grain or fruit trees. Another advantage which our southern farmers might have in trying to pattern after the farmers of Holland would be that they would not be obliged to go to so much additional expense for horse or mule power. Most of the cultivating of the soil there is done with a hoe and spade. I saw the people of Holland on Sunday and on weekdays, but I did not see a single Dutch man, woman or child in rags. There were practically no beggars and no very poor people. They owe their prosperity, too, very largely to their thorough and intelligent cultivation of the soil. Next to the thorough tilling of the soil, the thing of most interest there, from which the coloured people in America may learn a lesson, is the fine dairying which has made Holland famous throughout the world. Even the poorest family has its herd of Holstein cattle, and they are the finest specimens of cattle that it has ever been my pleasure to see. To watch thousands of these cattle grazing on the fields is worth a trip to Holland, as the result of the attention which they have given to breeding Holstein cattle. Dutch butter and cheese are in demand all through Europe. The most ordinary farmer there has a cash income as the result of the sale of his butter and milk. Many of these people make more out of the wind that blows over the fields than our poor southern people make out of the soil. The old-fashioned windmill is to be seen on every farm. This mill not only pumps the water for the livestock, but in many cases is made to operate the dairy, to saw the wood, to grind the grain, and to run the heavy machinery. These people are, however, not unlike our southern people in one respect and that is in having their women and children work in the fields. This, I think, is done in a larger measure even than in the south among the coloured people. An element of strength in the farming and dairying interests of these people is to be found in the fact that many of the farmers have received a college or university training. After this they take a special course in agriculture and dairying. This is as it should be. Our people in the South will prosper in proportion as a larger number of university men take up agriculture and kindred callings after they have finished their academic education. In the matter of physical appearance, including grace, beauty and carriage of the body, I think our own people are far ahead of the Dutch. But the Dutch are a hardy, rugged, industrial race of people. In our trip in the canal boat, we saw the men at the landings in large numbers, in their wooden shoes, and the women and children in their beautiful old-fashioned headdresses, each community having its own style of headdress, which has been handed down from one generation to another. We were in Rotterdam over Sunday. The free and rather boisterous commingling of the sexes on the street was noteworthy. In this also, our people in the United States could set an example to the Dutch. The foundation of the civilization of these people is in their regard for and respect for the law and their observance of it. This is the great lesson which the entire South must learn before it can hope to receive the respect and confidence of the world. 
Europeans do not understand how the South can disregard its own laws, as it so often does. If you ask any man on that side of the Atlantic why he does not emigrate to the southern part of the United States, he shrugs his shoulders and says, No law, they kill. I pray God that no part of our country may much longer have such a reputation as that in any part of the world. From Holland we went to Paris. On a beautiful sunny day, if you could combine the whirl of fashion and gaiety of New York City, Boston and Chicago on a prominent avenue, you would have some idea of what is to be seen in Paris upon one of her popular boulevards. Fashion seemed to sway everything in that great city. For example, when I went into a shoe store to purchase a pair of shoes, I could not find a pair large enough to be comfortable. I was gently told that it was not the fashion to wear large shoes there. One of the things I had in mind when I went to France was to visit the tomb of Toussaint, L'Ouverture, but I learned from some Haitian gentlemen residing in Paris that the grave of that general was in the northern part of France, and these same gentlemen informed me that his burial place is still without a monument of any kind. It seems that it has been in the minds of the Haitians for some time to remove his body to Haiti, but thus far it has been neglected. The Haitian government and people owe it to themselves, it appears to me, to see to it that the resting place of this great hero is given a proper memorial, either in France or on the island of Haiti. Speaking of the Haitians, there are a great many well-educated and cultivated men and women of that nationality in Paris. Numbers of them are sent there each year for education, and they take high rank in scholarship. It is greatly to be regretted, however, that some of these do not take advantage of the excellent training which is given there in the colleges of physical science, agriculture, mechanics and domestic science. They would then be in a position to return home and assist in developing the agricultural and mineral resources of their native land. Haiti will never be what it should be until a large number of the natives receive an education which will enable them to develop agriculture, build roads, start manufactories, build railroads and bridges and thus keep on the island the large amount of money which is now being sent outside for productions which these people themselves could supply. In all the European cities which we visited, we compared the conduct of the rank and file of the people on the streets, and in other places, with that of our own people in the United States. And we have no hesitation in saying that, in all that marks a lady or gentleman, our people in the South do not suffer at all by the comparison. Even at the camp meetings and other holiday gatherings in the South, the deportment of the masses of the coloured people is quite up to the standard of that of the average European in the larger cities which we saw. I should strongly advise our people against going to Europe, and especially to Paris, with the hope of securing employment, unless fortified by strong friends and a good supply of money. In one week in Paris, three men of my race called to see me, and in each case I found the man to be practically in a starving condition. They were well-meaning, industrious men, who had gone there with the idea that life was easy and work sure, but notwithstanding the fact that they walked the streets for days, they could get no work. The fact that they did not speak the language, nor understand the customs of the people, made their life just so much the harder. With the assistance of other Americans, I secured passage for one of these men to America. His parting word to me was, The United States is good enough for me in the future. End of chapter 10 European Impressions Recording by Luke Sartor Griffith, New South Wales
Chapter Eleven of Character Building. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Luke Sartor. Character Building by Booker T. Washington. Chapter Eleven The Value of System in Home Life. Most of you are going out from Tuskegee sooner or later to exert your influence in the home life of our people. You are going to have influence in homes of your own. You are going to have influence in the homes of your mothers and fathers, or in the homes of your relatives. You are going to exert an influence for good or for evil in the homes wherever you may go. Now the question how to bring about the greatest amount of happiness in these homes is one that should concern every student here. I say this because I want you to realize that each one of you is to go out from here to exert an influence. You are to exercise this influence in the communities where you go, and if you fail to exercise it for the good of other individuals, you have failed to accomplish the purpose for which this institution exists. In the first place, you want to exert your influence in those directions that will bring about the best results. Among these, it is important that the people have presented to them the highest forms of home life. Very often I find it true, and especially the more I travel about among our people that many persons have the idea that they cannot have comfortable homes unless they have a great amount of money. Now some of the happiest and most comfortable homes I have ever been in have been homes where the people have but little money. In fact, they might well be called poor people. But in these homes there was a certain degree of order and convenience which made you feel as comfortable as if you were in the homes of people of great wealth. I want to speak plainly. In the first place, there must be promptness in connection with everything in the life of the home. Take the matter of the meals, for instance. It is impossible for a home to be properly conducted unless there is a certain time for each meal, and promptness must be insisted on. In some homes, the breakfast may be eaten at six o'clock one morning, at eight o'clock the next morning, and perhaps at nine o'clock the morning after that. Dinner may be served at twelve, one, or two o'clock, and supper may be eaten at five, six, or seven. And even then, one half the members of the family are absent when the meal is served. There is useless waste of time and energy in this, and an unnecessary amount of worry. It saves time, and it saves a great amount of worry, to have it understood that there is to be a certain time for each meal, and that all the members of the family are to be present at that time. In this way the family will get rid of a great deal of annoyance, and precious time will be saved, to be used in reading, or in some other useful occupation. Then as to the matter of system, no matter how cheap your homes are, no matter how poverty-stricken you may be in regard to money. It is possible for each home to have its affairs properly systematized. I wonder how many housekeepers can go into their homes on the darkest night there is and put their hands on the box of matches without difficulty. That is one way to test a good housekeeper. If she cannot do this, then there is a waste of time. It saves time, and it saves worry, too, if you have a certain place in which the matches are to be kept, and if you teach all the members of the family that the matches are always to be kept in that place. Oftentimes you find the matchbox on the table, or on a shelf in the corner of the room, or perhaps on the floor, sometimes here, sometimes there. In many homes, five or ten minutes are wasted every day just on account of the negligence of the housekeeper or the wife in this little matter. 
Then as to the matter of the dishcloth. You should have a place for your dishcloth, and put it there every day. The persons who do not have a place for an article are the persons who are found looking indoors and out of doors for it, from five to ten minutes every time that article is needed. They will be saying, Johnny or Jenny, where is it? Where did you put it the last time you had it? And all that kind of thing. The same thing is true of the broom. In the first place, in the home where there is system, you do not find the broom left standing on the wrong end. I hope all of you know which the right end of the broom is in this respect. You do not find the broom on the wrong end, and you always find that there is a certain place for it, and that it is kept there. When things are out of place, and you have to hunt for them, you are spending not only time, but you are spending strength that should be used in some more profitable way. There should be a place for the coat and the cloak, for the hat, and in fact a place for everything in the house. The people who have a place for everything are the people who will find time to read, and who will have time for recreation. You wonder sometimes how the people in New England can afford to have so much time for reading books and newspapers, and still have sufficient money to send as much as they do here to this institute to be used in our education. These people find time to keep themselves thus intelligent, and to keep themselves in touch with all that takes place in the world, because everything is so well systematized about their homes that they save the time which you and I spend in worrying about something which we should know all about. I have very rarely gone into a boarding house kept by our people and found the lamp in its proper place. When you go into such a house, it is too apt to be the case that the people there will have to look for the lamp. Then, when they have found it, it is not filled. Somebody forgot to put the oil in it in the morning. And then they have to go and hunt up a wick. And then they must get a chimney. Then, when they get all these things, they must hunt for the matches to light the lamp. I wonder how many girls there are here now who can go into a room and arrange it properly for an individual to sleep in. That is, provide the proper number of towels, the soap and matches, and everything that should be provided for the comfort of the person who is to use the room, put in the room and put in its proper place. I should be afraid to test some of you. You must learn to be able to do such things before you leave here, in order that you may be of some use to yourself and to others. If you are not able to do this, you will be a disappointment to us. End of chapter 11 The Value of System in Home Life Recording by Luke Sartor Griffith, New South Wales Chapter 12 of Character Building this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Luke Sartor. Character Building by Booker T. Washington. Chapter 12 What Will Pay? I wish to talk with you for a few minutes upon a subject that is much discussed, especially by young people. What things pay in life? There is no question, perhaps, which is asked oftener by a person entering upon a career than this. What will pay? Will this course of action, or that business? What will pay? Let us see if we can answer that question. A question which every student in this school should ask himself or herself, 
what will profit me most what will make my life most useful what will bring about the greatest degree of happiness what will pay best not long ago a certain minister secured the testimony of forty men who had been successful in business persons who beyond question had been pronounced to be business men of authority the question which this minister put to these business men was whether under any circumstances it paid to be dishonest in business whether they had found in all their business career that under any circumstances it paid to cheat swindle or take advantage of their fellow men or in any way to deceive those with whom they came in contact every one of the forty answered without hesitation that nothing short of downright honesty and fair dealings ever paid in any business they said that no one could succeed permanently in business that was not honest in dealing with his fellow men to say nothing of the future life or of doing right for right's sake it does not pay an individual to do anything except what his conscience will approve of every day and every hour and minute in the day i want you to put that question to yourselves tonight ask yourselves what course of action will pay you may be tempted to go astray in the matter of money think when you are tempted to do that what will pay persons who are likely to go astray in the matter of money furthermore are likely to do so in the matter of dress tampering with each other's property and the matter of acting dishonestly with each other's books such persons will be dishonest in the matter of labor too it pays an individual to be honest with another person's money it never pays to be dishonest in taking another person's clothes or books none of these things ever pays and when you have occasion to yield or not to yield to such a temptation you should ask yourself the question will it pay me to do this put that question constantly to yourself whenever you promise moreover to do a piece of work for a man there is a contract binding you to do an honest day's labor and the man to pay you for an honest day's labor if you fail to give such service if you break that contract you will find that such a course of action never pays it will never pay you to deal dishonestly with an individual or to permit dishonest dealing if you fail to give a full honest day's work if you know that you have done only three quarters of a day's work or four fifths it may seem to you at the time that it is paid but in the long run you lose by it i regret to say that we sometimes have occasion to meet students here who are inclined to be dishonest such students come to mr palmer or to me and say they wish to go home when they are asked why they wish to go home some of them say that they wish to go because they are sick then when they have been talked with a few minutes they may say that they do not like the food here or perhaps that some disappointment has befallen their parents in some cases i have students give me half a dozen excuses in little more than the same number of minutes the proper thing for students to do when they wish to go home is to state the exact reason and then stick to it the student who does this is the kind that will succeed in the world the students who are downright dishonest in what they say will find out that they are not strong in anything that they are not what they ought to be the time will come when that sort of thing will carry them down instead of up in a certain year i think it was eighteen fifty seven there was a great financial panic in the united states 
especially in the city of New York. A great many of the principal banks in the country failed, and others were in daily danger of failure. I remember a story that was told of one of the bank presidents of that time, William Taylor, I believe. All the bank presidents in the city of New York were having meetings every night to find out how well they were succeeding in keeping their institutions solvent. At one of these meetings, after a critical day in the most trying period of the panic, when some men reported that they had lost money during that day, and others that so much money had been withdrawn from their banks during the day, that if there were another like it, they did not see how they could stand the strain. William Taylor reported that money had been added to the deposits of his bank that day, instead of being withdrawn. What was behind all this? William Taylor had learned in early life that it did not pay to be dishonest, but that it paid to be honest with all his depositors and with all persons who did business with his bank. When other people were failing in all parts of the country, the evidence of this man's character, his regard for truth and honest dealing, caused money to come into his bank when it was being withdrawn from others. Character is a power. If you want to be powerful in the world, if you want to be strong, influential, and useful, you can be so, in no better way than by having strong character. But you cannot have a strong character if you yield to the temptations about which I have been speaking. Someone asked some time ago what it was that gave such a power to the sermons of the late Dr. John Hall. In the usual sense, he was not a powerful speaker but everything he said carried conviction with it. The explanation was that the character of the man was behind the sermon. You may go out and make great speeches. You may write books or addresses, which are great literature. But unless you have character behind what you say and write, it will amount to nothing. It will all go to the winds. I leave this question with you, then. When you are tempted to do what your conscience tells you is not right, ask yourself, will it pay me to do this thing which I know is not right? Go to the penitentiary. Ask the people there who have failed, who have made mistakes, why they are there. And in every case, they will tell you that they are there because they yielded to temptation because they did not ask themselves the question, Will it pay? Go ask those people who have no care for life, who have thrown away their virtue, as it were. Ask them why they are without character. And the answer will be, in so many words, that they sought but temporary success. In order to find some short road to success, in order to have momentary happiness, they yielded to temptation. We want to feel that in every student who goes out from here, there is a character which can be depended upon in the night as well as in the day. That is the kind of young men and young women we wish to send out from here. Whenever you are tempted to yield a hair's breadth in the direction which I have indicated, Ask yourself the question, over and over again, Will it pay me in this world? Will it pay me in the world to come? End of chapter 12 What Will Pay? Recording by Luke Sartor Griffith, New South Wales Chapter 13 of Character Building This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Luke Sartor. Character Building by Booker T. Washington. Chapter 13. Education that Educates. This talk was given soon after the visit of President McKinley to Tuskegee Institute in the fall of 1898. Perhaps I am safe in saying that during the last ten days you have not given much systematic effort to book study in the usual sense. When interruptions come, such as we have just had, taking you away from your regular routine work and study, and the preparation of routine lessons is interrupted, the first thought to some may be that this time is lost, in so far as it relates to education in the ordinary sense, that it is so much time taken away from that part of one's life that should be devoted to acquiring education. I suppose that during the last few days the questions have come to many of you. What are we gaining? What are we getting from the irregularity that has characterized the school grounds within the last week that will in any degree compensate for the amount of book study that we have lost? To my mind, I do not believe that you have lost anything by the interruption. On the other hand, I am convinced that you have got the best kind of education. I do not mean to say that we can depend upon it for all time to come, for systematic training of the mind. But so far as real education, so far as development of the mind and heart and body are concerned, I do not believe that a single student has lost anything by the irregularity of the last week or more. You have gained in this respect in preparing for the reception and entertainment of the President of the United States and his Cabinet, and the distinguished persons who accompanied the party. You have had to do an amount of original thinking, which you, perhaps, have never had to do before in your lives. You have been compelled to think. You have been compelled to put more than your bodily strength into what you have been doing. You could not have made the magnificent exhibition of our work which you have made if you had not been compelled to do original thinking and execution. Most of you never saw such an exhibition before. I never did. Those of you who had to construct floats that would illustrate our agricultural work and our mechanical and academic work had to put a certain amount of original thought into the planning of these floats in order to make them show the work to the best advantage. And two-thirds of you, yes, practically all of you, had never seen anything of the kind before. For this reason, it was a matter that had to be thought out by you and planned out by you, and then put into visible shape. Now compare that kind of education with the mere committing to memory of certain rules or something which someone else thought out and executed a thousand years ago, perhaps. And that is what a large part of our education really is. Education, in the usual sense of the word, is the mere committing to memory of something which has been known before us. Now, during the last ten days, we have had to solve problems of our own, not problems and puzzles that someone else originated for us, I do not believe that there is a person connected with the institution who is not stronger in mind, who is not more self-confident and self-reliant, so far as the qualities relate to what he is able to do with his mind or his hands, than he was ten or twelve days ago. There is the benefit that came to all of us. It put us to thinking and planning. It brought us into contact with things that are out of the ordinary, and there is no education that surpasses this. I see more and more every year that the world is to be brought to the study of men and of things, rather than to the study of mere books. You will find more and more as the years go by that people will gradually lay aside books and study the nature of man in a way they have never done as yet. I tell you then that in this interruption of the regular school work, you have not lost anything. You have gained. You have had your minds awakened, your faculties strengthened, and your hands guided. I do not wish to speak of this matter egotistically. 
but it is true that I have heard a great many persons from elsewhere mention the pleasure which they have received in meeting Tuskegee students, because when they come in contact with a student who has been here, they are impressed with the fact that he or she does not seem to be dead or sleepy. They say that when they meet a Tuskegee boy or girl, they find a person who has had contact with real life. The education that you have been getting during the last few days, you will find, as the years go by, has been of a kind that will serve you in good stead all through your lives. Just in proportion as we learn to execute something, to put our education into tangible form, as we have been doing during the last few days, in just the same proportion will we find ourselves of value as individuals and as a race. Those people who came here to visit us knew perfectly well that we could commit to memory certain lines of poetry. They knew we were able to solve certain problems in algebra and geometry. They understood that we could learn certain rules in chemistry and agriculture. But what interested them most was to see us put into visible form the results of our education. Just in proportion as an individual is able to do that, he is of value to the world. That is the object of the work which we are trying to do here. We are trying to turn out men and women who are able to do something that the world wants done, that the world needs to have done. Just in proportion as you can comply with that demand, you will find that there is a place for you. There is going to be standing room. By the training we are giving you here, we are preparing you for a place in the world. We are going to train you so that when you get to that place, if you fail in it, the failure will not be our fault. It is a great satisfaction to have connected with a race men and women who are able to do something. Not merely to talk about doing it, not merely to theorize about doing it, but actually to do something that makes the world better to live in, something that enhances the comforts and conveniences of life. I had a good example of this last week. I wanted something done in my office which required a practical knowledge of electricity. It was a great satisfaction when I called upon one of the teachers to have him do the work in a careful, praiseworthy manner. It is very well to talk or lecture about electricity, but it is better to be able to do something of value with one's knowledge of electricity. And so, as you go on, increasing your ability to do things of value, you will find that the problem which often nowadays looks more and more difficult of solution will gradually become easier. One of the cabinet members who were here a few days ago said, after witnessing the exhibition which you made here, that the islands which this country had taken into its possession during the recent war are soon going to require the service of every man and woman we can turn out from this institution. You will find it true, not only in this country, but in other countries, that the demand will be more and more for people who can do something. Just in proportion as we can, as a race, get the reputation which I spoke to you about a few days ago, you will find there will be places for us. Regardless of colour or condition, the world is going to give the places of trust and remuneration to the men and women who can do a certain thing as well as anybody else or better. This is the whole problem. Shall we prepare ourselves to do something as well as anybody else or better? Just in proportion as we do this, you will find that nothing under the sun will keep us back. End of chapter 13 Education that Educates Recording by Luke Sartor Griffith, New South Wales Chapter 14 of Character Building This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Luke Sartor. Character Building by Booker T. Washington. Chapter 14. The Importance of Being Reliable. I am going to call your attention this evening to a tendency of the people of our race, which I had occasion to notice in the course of a visit recently made to certain portions of North Carolina and South Carolina. I find that with persons who are the employers, or who might be the employers, of numbers of our people, there is a very general impression that as a race we lack steadiness, that we lack steadiness as labourers. Now you may say that this is not true, and you may cite any number of instances to show that we are not unreliable in that respect. Whether it is true or not, the results are the same. It works against us in the matter of securing, paying employment. Almost without exception, in talking with persons who are in a position to employ us, or who have been employing us, or who are thinking of employing us, I have found that this objection has been very largely in their minds, that we cannot be depended upon, that we are unsteady and unreliable in matters of labour. I am speaking, of course, of that class of people of our race, who depend mainly upon a day's work, working by the day, as we call it, for their living. These men with whom I talked gave several illustrations of this tendency. In the first place, I think they mentioned, without exception, this fact, that if the coloured people are employed in a factory, they work well and steadily for a few days, say, until Saturday night comes, and they are paid their week's wages. Then they cannot be depended upon to put in an appearance the following Monday morning. That special criticism was made without exception. The coloured people, these men said, would work earnestly and give good satisfaction until they got a little money ahead and got food enough assured to last them two or three weeks. Then they would give up the job or simply remain away from the factory until others had been put in their places. That was one of the statements that was made to me over and over again. People also mentioned to me as an unfavourable tendency the inclination which the people of our race have to go on excursions. They said that if an excursion were going to Wilmington or Greensboro or Charleston and the coloured people had a little money on hand, you could not depend on their going to work instead of going on the excursion that people would say that they must go on this or that excursion, and that nothing should stop them. A great many people lose employment and money because of this tendency to go on excursions. Another thing that was mentioned to me was the Sunday dinners. Our people are too likely to starve all through the week, and then on Sunday invite all the neighbours to come in and eat up what they have made through the week. People say that we take our week's earnings on Saturday night, and go to the market and spend it all, and then invite all of our kindred and neighbours to come in on Sunday to have a great party. Then by Monday morning we have made ourselves so ill by overeating that we are unfit for work. This was given as one of the reasons which cause people to complain of our race for unsteadiness. And then there was complaint of a general lack of perseverance, of an unwillingness to be steady, to put money into the bank, to begin at the bottom and gradually work toward the top. You can easily see some of the results of such a reputation as this. I have noticed some of the results in many of the places where our people have been securing paying employment. One result is a general distrust of the entire race in matters pertaining to industry. Another is that people are not going to employ persons on whom they cannot depend to fill responsible positions. Employers are not likely to employ for responsible positions persons who are likely to go away unexpectedly on excursions. Another result is loss of money. You will find many of our people in poverty simply because, in so large a measure, 
we have got this reputation of being unsteady and unreliable. Wherever our people are not getting regular paying employment, it is largely on account of these things of which I have been speaking, and gradually the opportunities for employment are slipping into the hands of the people of other races. You can easily understand that when people are not getting steady employment, but a job this week and a job next week, and perhaps nothing the week after, it is impossible for them to put money in the bank, impossible to acquire homes and property, and to settle down as reliable, prosperous citizens. Now, how are we going to change all these things? I do not see any hope unless we can depend upon you to change them. You young men and young women who are being educated in institutions of learning. It rests largely with you to change public sentiment among our people in all these directions to a point where we shall feel that we must be as reliable and as responsible as it is possible for the people of any other race to be. But in order to do this, it is necessary for you to learn how to control yourselves in these respects. Young men come here and want to work at this industry or that for a while, and then get tired and want to change to something else. Some come with a strong determination to work and stay until something happens that is not quite pleasant, and then they want to leave and go to some other school or go back home. Now we cannot make the leaders and the examples of our people that we should make if we are going to be guilty of these same weaknesses in these institutions. Let each of you take control of himself or herself and determine that whatever you plan to be, you are going to be. You are going to keep driving away, pegging away, moving on and on each hour, each day, until you have accomplished the purpose for which you came here. Such are the persons, the men and women, that the world is looking for. These are the men and women we want to send to North Carolina and South Carolina to Georgia, to Mississippi, and about in our own state of Alabama, to reach hundreds and thousands of our people, and to bring about such a sentiment that these people can control themselves in the directions I have mentioned, and become steady and reliable along all the avenues of industry. I have spoken very plainly about these things, because I believe that they are matters to which, as a race, we ought to give more attention. No race can thrive and prosper and grow strong if it is living on the outer edges of the industrial world, is jumping here and there after a job that somebody else has given up. At the risk of repeating myself, I say that we must give attention to this matter. We must be more trustworthy and more reliable in matters of labour. As you go home and go into your churches, your schools and your families, Teach and talk from day to day the doctrine that our people must become steady and reliable, must become worthy of confidence in all their occupations. I am sorry to say that it is too often true of young people that they overlook these matters in their conversation. We are always ready to talk about Mars and Jupiter, about the sun and moon, and about things under the earth and over the earth. In fact, about everything except these little matters that have so much to do with our real living. Now, if we cannot put a spirit of determination into you to go out and change public sentiment, then the future for us as a race is not very bright. But I have faith in you to believe that you are going to set a higher standard for yourselves in all these matters, and that if you can stay here two, four, five years, some of you will control yourselves in all those respects and will bring yourselves to be examples of what we hope and expect the world whom you are going to teach are to become. If you will do this, you will find that in a few years there will be a decided change for the better in the things of which I have spoken, a change in regard to these matters that will make us as a race firmer and stronger in these important directions. End of 
Chapter 14 The Importance of Being Reliable Recording by Luke Sartor Griffith, New South Wales Chapter 15 of Character Building This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Luke Sartor Character Building by Booker T. Washington Chapter 15 The Highest Education it may seem to some of you that I am continually talking to you about education, the right kind of education, how to get an education, and such kindred subjects. But surely no subject could be more pertinent, since the object for which you all are here is to get an education. And if you are to do this, you wish to get the best kind possible. You will understand, then, I am sure, if I speak often about this, or refer to the subject frequently, that it is because I am very anxious that all of you go out from here with a definite and correct idea of what is meant by education, of what an education is meant to accomplish, what it may be expected to do for one. We are very apt to get the idea that education means the memorizing of a number of dates, of being able to state when a certain battle took place, of being able to recall with accuracy this event or that event. We are likely to get the impression that education consists in being able to commit to memory a certain number of rules in grammar, a certain number of rules in arithmetic, and in being able to locate correctly on the earth's surface this mountain or that river, and to name this lake and that gulf. Now, I do not mean to disparage the value of this kind of training, because among the things that education should do for us is to give us strong, orderly, and well-developed minds. I do not wish to have you get the idea that I undervalue or overlook the strengthening of the mind. If there is one person more than another who is to be pitied, it is the individual who is all heart and no head. You will see numbers of persons going through the world whose hearts are full of good things, running over with the wish to do something to make somebody better, or the desire to make somebody happier. But they have made the sad mistake of being absolutely without development of mind to go with this willingness of heart. We want development of mind, and we want strengthening of the mind. I have often said to you that one of the best things that education can do for an individual is to teach that individual to get hold of what he wants, rather than to teach him how to commit to memory a number of facts in history or a number of names in geography. I wish you to feel that we can give you here orderliness of mind, I mean a trained mind, that will enable you to find dates in history or to put your finger on names in geography when you want them. I wish to give you an education that will enable you to construct rules in grammar and arithmetic for yourselves. That is the highest kind of training. But after all, this kind of thing is not the end of education. What then do we mean by education? I would say that education is meant to give us an idea of truth. Whatever we get out of textbooks, whatever we get out of industry, whatever we get here and there from any sources, if we do not get the idea of truth at the end, we do not get education. I do not care how much you get out of history or geography or algebra or literature. I do not care how much you have got out of all your textbooks. Unless you have got truth, you have failed in your purpose to be educated. Unless you get the idea of truth so pure that you cannot be false in anything, your education is a failure. Then education is meant to make us just in our dealings with our fellow men. The man or woman who has learned to be absolutely just, so far as he can interpret, has, in that degree, an education, is to that degree an educated man or woman. 
education is meant to make us change for the better, to make us more thoughtful, to make us so broad that we will not seek to help one man because he belongs to this race or that race of people, and seek to hinder another man because he does not belong to this race or that race of people. Education in the broadest and truest sense will make an individual seek to help all people, regardless of race, regardless of colour, regardless of condition. And you will find that the person who is most truly educated is the one who is going to be kindest and is going to act in the gentlest manner toward people who are unfortunate, toward the race or the individual that is most despised. The highly educated person is the one who is the most considerate of those individuals who are less fortunate. I hope that when you go out from here and meet persons who are afflicted by poverty, whether of mind or body, or persons who are unfortunate in any way, that you will show your education by being just as kind and just as considerate toward those persons as it is possible for you to be. That is the way to test a person with education. You may see ignorant persons who perhaps think themselves educated going about the street who, when they meet an individual who is unfortunate, lame, or with a defect of body, mind or speech, are inclined to laugh at and make sport of that individual. But the highly educated person, the one who is really cultivated, is gentle and sympathetic to everyone. Education is meant to make us absolutely honest in dealing with our fellows. I don't care how much arithmetic we have, or how many cities we can locate. It all is useless unless we have an education that makes us absolutely honest. Education is meant to make us give satisfaction and to get satisfaction out of giving it. It is meant to make us get happiness out of service for our fellows. And until we get to the point where we can get happiness and supreme satisfaction out of helping our fellows, we are not truly educated. Education is meant to make us generous. In this connection, let me say that I very much hope that when you go out from here, you will show that you have learned this lesson of being generous in all charitable objects, in the support of your churches, your Sunday schools, your hospitals, and in being generous in giving help to the poor. I hope, for instance, that a large proportion of you, in fact all of you, will make it a practice to give something yearly to this institution. If you cannot give but twenty-five cents, fifty cents, or a dollar a year, I hope you will put it down as a thing that you will not forget, to give something to this institution every year. We want to show to our friends, who have done so much for us, who have supported this school so generously, how much interest we take in the institution that has given us so nearly all that we possess. I hope that every senior in particular will keep this in mind. I am glad to say that we have many graduates who send us such sums, even if small, and one graduate who, for the last eight or ten years, has sent us ten dollars annually. I hope a number of you in the senior class that I see before me will do the same thing. Education is meant to make us appreciate the things that are beautiful in nature. A person is never educated unless he is able to go into the swamps and woods and see something that is beautiful in the trees and shrubs there. He is able to see something beautiful in the grass and flowers that surround him. He is, in short, able to see something beautiful, elevating and inspiring in everything that God has created. Not only should education enable us to see the beauty in these objects which God has put about us, but it is meant to influence us to bring beautiful objects about us. I hope that each one of you, after you graduate, will surround himself at home with what is beautiful, inspiring and elevating. I do not believe that any person is educated 
so long as he lives in a dirty, miserable shanty. I do not believe that any person is educated until he has learned to want to live in a clean room made attractive with pictures and books and with such surroundings as are elevating. In a word, I wish to say again that education is meant to give us that culture, that refinement, that taste which will make us deal truthfully with our fellow men and will make us see what is beautiful, elevating and inspiring in what God has created. I want you to bear in mind that your textbooks, with all their contents, are not an end, but a means to an end, a means to help us get the highest, the best, the purest, and the most beautiful things out of life. End of chapter 15 The Highest Education Recording by Luke Sartor Chapter 16 of Character Building This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Luke Sartor Character Building by Booker T. Washington Chapter 16 Unimproved Opportunities Several of the things which I shall say to you tonight may not sound very agreeable or encouraging to many of you, yet I think you will agree with me that they are facts that cannot be denied. We must recognize the fact, in the first place, that our condition as a race is, in a large measure, different from the condition of the white race by which we are surrounded, that our capacity is very largely different from that of the people of the white race. I know we like to say the opposite. It sounds well in compositions, does well in rhetoric, and makes a splendid essay for us to make the opposite assertion. It does very well in a newspaper article. But when we come down to hard facts, we must acknowledge that our condition and capacity are not equal to those of the majority of the white people with whom we come in daily contact. Of course that does not sound very well. But to say that we are equal to the whites is to say that slavery was no disadvantage to us. That is the logic of it. To illustrate, suppose a person has been confined in a sick room, deprived of the use of his faculties, the use of his body and senses, and that he comes out and is placed by the side of a man who has been healthy in body and mind. Are these two persons in the same condition? Are they equal in capacity? Is the young animal of a week old, although he has all the characteristics that his mother has, as strong as she? With proper development, he will be, in time, as strong as she. But it is unreasonable to say that he is as strong at present. And so, I think, this is all that we can say of ourselves. With proper development, our condition and capacity will be the same as those of the people of any other race. Now, the fact that our capacity as a people is different, and that the conditions which we must meet are different, makes it reasonable for us to believe that, when the question of education is considered, we shall find that different educational methods are desirable for us, from those which would be appropriate to the needs of a people whose capacity and conditions are different from ours. What we most need, in my opinion, for the next few generations, is such an education that will help us most effectively to conquer the forces of nature. I mean in the general sense of supplying food, clothing, homes, and a substantial provision for the future. Do not think that I mean by this that I do not believe in every individual getting all the education he or she can get, for I do. But since for some years to come, at least, it must of necessity be impossible for all of our young people to get all the education possible, or even all they may want to get, 
I believe they should apply their energies to getting such a training as will be best fitted to supply their immediate needs. In Scotland, for instance, where higher education has been within reach of the people for many years, and where the people have reached a high degree of civilization, it is not out of place for the young people to give their time and attention to the study of metaphysics and of law and the other professions. Of course, I do not mean to say that we shall not have lawyers and metaphysicians and other professional men after a while, but I do mean to say that I think the efforts of a large majority of us should be devoted to securing the material necessities of life. When you speak to the average person about labour, industrial work especially, he seems to get the idea at once that you are opposed to his head being educated, that you simply wish to put him to work. Anybody that knows anything about industrial education knows that it teaches a person just the opposite, how not to work. It teaches him to make water work for him, air, steam, and all the forces of nature. This is what is meant by industrial education. Let us make an illustration. Yesterday I was over in the creamery and became greatly interested in the process of separating the cream. The only energy spent was that required to turn a crank. The apparatus had been so constructed as to utilize natural forces. Now compare the old process of butter making with the new. Before, you had to go through a long process of drudgery before the cream could be separated from the milk, and then another long process before the cream could be turned into butter. And then, even after churning three or four hours at a time, you got only a small portion of butter. Now what we mean by giving you an industrial education is to teach you so, to put brains into your work, that if your work is butter making, you can make butter simply by standing at a machine and turning a crank. If you are studying chemistry, be sure you get all you can out of the course here, and then go to a higher school somewhere else. Become as proficient in the science as you can. When you have done this, do not sit down and wait for the world to honour you because you know a great deal about chemistry. You will be disappointed if you doubt if you wish to make the best use of your knowledge of chemistry. Come back here to the south and use it in making this poor soil rich and in making good butter where the farmers have made poor butter before. Used in this way, you will find that your knowledge of chemistry will cause others to honour you. During the last thirty years, we, as a race, have let some golden opportunities slip from us, and partly, I fear, because we have not had enough plain talk in the direction I am following with you tonight. If you ever have an opportunity to go into any of the large cities of the North, you will be able to see for yourself what I mean. I remember that the first time I went North, and it was not so very many years ago, it was not an uncommon thing to see the barber shops in the hands of coloured men. I know coloured men who in that way could have become comfortably rich. You cannot find day in the city of New York or Boston a first-class barber shop in the hands of coloured men. That opportunity is gone, and something is wrong that it is so. Coming nearer home, go to Montgomery, Memphis, New Orleans, and you will find that the barber shops are gradually slipping away from the hands of the coloured men, and they are going back into dark streets, and opening little holes. These opportunities have slipped from us, largely because we have not learned to dignify labour. The coloured man puts a dirty little chair and a pair of razors into a dirtier looking hole while the white man opens his shop on one of the principal streets, or, in connection with some fashionable hotel, fits it up luxuriously with carpets, handsome mirrors and other attractive furniture, and calls the place a tonsorial parlour. The proprietor sits at his desk and takes the cash. He has transformed what we call drudgery into a paying business. 
Still another instance. You can remember that only a few years ago, one of the best paying positions that a large number of coloured men filled was that of doing whitewashing. A few years ago it would not have been hard to see coloured men in Boston, Philadelphia or Washington carrying a whitewash tub and a long pole into somebody's house to do a job of whitewashing. You go into the north today and you will find very few coloured men at that work. White men learned that they could dignify that branch of labour and they began to study it in schools. They gained knowledge of chemistry which would enable them to understand the mixing of the necessary ingredients. They learned decorating and frescoing, and now they call themselves house decorators. Now that job is gone, perhaps to come no more, for now that these men have elevated this work and introduced more intelligent skill into it, do you suppose anyone is going to allow some old man with a pole and a bucket to come into the house? Then there is the field occupied by the cooks. You know that all over the South we have held and still hold to a large extent the matter of cooking in our hands. Wherever there was any cooking to be done, a coloured man or a coloured woman did it. But while we still have something of a monopoly of this work, it is a fact that even this is slipping away from us. People do not wish always to eat fried meat and bread that is made almost wholly of water and salt. They get tired of such food, and they desire a person to cook for them who will put brains into the work. To meet this demand, white people have transformed what was once the menial occupation of cooking into a profession. They have gone to school and studied how to elevate this work. And if we can judge by the almost total absence of coloured cooks in the North, we are led to believe that they have learned how. Even here in the South, coloured cooks are gradually disappearing, and unless they exert themselves, they will go entirely. They have disappeared in the North because they have not kept pace with the demand for the most improved methods of cooking, and because they have not realised that the world is moving forward rapidly in the march of civilization. A few days ago, when in Chicago, I noticed in one of the fashionable restaurants a fine-looking man, well-dressed, who seemed to be the proprietor. I asked who he was, and was told that he was the chef, as he is called the head cook. Of course, I was surprised to see a man dressed so stylishly and presenting such an air of culture, filling the place of chief cook in a restaurant. But I remembered then, more forcibly than ever, that cooking had been transformed into a profession, into dignified labour. Still another opportunity is going, and we laugh when we mention it, although it is really no laughing matter. When we think of what we might have done to elevate it in the same way that white persons have elevated it, we realise that it was an opportunity after all. I refer to the opportunity which was in boot-blacking. Of course, here in the South, we have that yet, to a large extent, because the competition here is not quite so sharp as in the North. In too many southern towns and cities, if you wish your shoes blacked, you wait until you meet a boy with a box slung over his shoulder. When he begins to polish your shoes, you will very likely see that he uses a much-worn shoe brush, or worse still, a scrubbing brush, and unless you watch him closely, there is a chance that he will polish your shoes with stove polish. But if you go into a northern city, you will find that such a boy as this does not stand a chance of making a living. White boys, and even men, have open shops, which they have fitted up with carpets, pictures, mirrors, and comfortable chairs and sometimes their brushes are even run by electricity. They have the latest newspapers always within reach for their patrons to read while their work is being done, and they grow rich. The man who owns and runs such a place as that is not called a boot black. He is called the proprietor of such and such a shoe-blacking emporium, 
and that chance is gone to come no more. Now there are many coloured men who understand about electricity, but where is the coloured man who would apply his knowledge of that science to running brushes in a boot-black stand? In the South it was a common thing when anybody was taken ill to notify the old mammy nurse. We had a monopoly of the nursing business for many years, and up to a short time ago it was the common opinion that nobody could nurse but one of those old black mammies. But this idea is being dissipated. In the North, when a person gets ill, he does not think of sending for anyone but a professional nurse, one who has received a diploma from some nurse training school, or a certificate of proficiency from some reputable institution. I hope you have understood me in what I have been trying to say of these little things. They all tend to show that if we are to keep pace with the progress of civilization, we must pay attention to the small things as well as the larger and more important things in life. They go to prove that we must put brains into what we do. If education means anything at all, it means putting brains into the common affairs of life and making something of them. That is just what we are seeking to tell the world through the work of this institution. There are many opportunities all about us where we can use our education. You very rarely see a man idle who knows all about house building, who knows how to draw plans to test the strength of materials that enter into the making of a first-class house. Did you ever see such a man out of a job? Did you ever see such a man as that writing letters to this place and that place applying for work? People are wanted all over the world who can do work well. Men and women are wanted who understand the preparation and supplying of food. I don't mean in the small menial sense, but people who know all about it. Even in this there is great opportunity. A few days ago I met a woman who had spent years in this country and in Europe studying the subject of food economics in all its details, I learn that this person is in constant demand by institutions of learning and other establishments, where the preparation and the serving of food are important features. She spends a few months at each institution. She is wanted everywhere, because she has applied her knowledge to one of the most important necessities of life, and so you will find it all through life. Those persons who are going to be constantly sought after, constantly in demand, are those who make the best use of their opportunities, who work unceasingly to become proficient in what they attempt to do. Always be sure that you have something out of which you can make a living, and then you will not only be independent, but you will be in a much better position to help your fellow men. I have spoken about these matters at this length, because I believe them to be the foundation of our future success. We often hear a man spoken of as having moral character. A man cannot have moral character unless he has something to wear, and something to eat, 365 days in a year. He cannot have any religion either. You will find at the bottom of much crime the fact that the criminals have not had the common necessities of life supplied them. Men must have some of the comforts and conveniences. Certainly the necessities of life supplied them, before they can be morally or religiously what they ought to be. End of chapter 16 Unimproved Opportunities Recording by Luke Sartor Griffith, New South Wales Chapter 17 of Character Building This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Luke Sartor Character Building by Booker T. Washington Chapter 17 Keeping Your Word I do not want to speak to you continually about subjects that tend to show up the weaker traits of character which our race has. But there are some characteristic points in our life, so important, that it seems to me well 
that we emphasize those which are especially weak just now. A few weeks ago I mentioned two or three examples which had come under my own personal observation of the unreliability of the race, and to those I now add one or two more. On three distinct occasions while travelling I have found it necessary to make engagements with hack men to call at a certain hour in the morning to take me to an early train, and on no one of these occasions has the hack man kept his word. In the first case, the man disappointed me entirely, so that I had to walk to the station, a distance of a mile or more. In the second instance, the hack man was to come at six o'clock, and did not come until half past six. By this time I had started to walk, and had gone two or three squares, meeting him on the way to the place where I had stopped. In the third case, the man was at least an hour late when we met him after we had walked over half the distance to the station. I have spoken at another time of the fact that men who employ coloured workmen have complained to me that after these men had drawn a week's pay, they could not be depended upon to return to work the next Monday morning. In the city of Savannah, Georgia, there are a great many coloured men employed as stevedores men, who load and unload ships. If you have read the newspapers carefully, you will have noticed that recently the persons who employ these men have made a new rule, by which they refuse to pay the stevedores all of their wages at the end of the week, but retain two days' payout of each week, from every individual who works for them, to be paid to them at the end of the next week. Of course, the men do not lose anything in the end by this method. It simply means that so long as they work for one employer, there are at least two days' pay due them. Of course the labourers, whose wages were thus kept back, have made a great noise about it. But when their employers were asked for an explanation, they said, We find by your experience that if we pay you all that we owe you on Saturday night, we cannot depend upon your returning on Monday morning to continue your work. You are apt to get drunk, or to debauch yourselves on Sunday, so that you are unfitted for your work the next day. This is the decision these men have arrived at, after having employed these men for a number of years. Now, think of the things I have spoken to you about. You may say with regard to the last, that to a great extent this action on the part of the Savannah employers was due to prejudice to a desire to use the money withheld for their own selfish purposes, and because they had the power to do so. But you can very easily understand that if a person goes on being disappointed month after month in his business, he will soon conclude that it is best for him to try a hack man of some other colour and disposition, and that if these Savannah employers find year after year that they cannot depend on coloured men to give them thorough, regular, systematic labour, they are going to look out for persons of another race who will do their work properly. It is not necessary for me to continue in this strain, and to call attention to other incidents of this kind, to show, as I have told you before, that one of the weak points which we as a race must fight against is that of not being reliable. Of course, I understand that it is not always possible for a person to keep an engagement, but if he cannot, it is very rarely the case that he cannot send word to the persons with whom he has made the engagement of his inability to keep his part of it. In the case of the hackmen who disappointed me, if they had sent word two or three hours ahead of the time that they could not come, or if they had sent another hackman to fill the engagement for them, I should have thought nothing about it. In the case of those savannah labourers, when they found that they could not go back to their work promptly, if they had sent word to that effect, their absence, perhaps, could have been excused. But it is this habit of disappointing people in business matters, without apparent care or concern, that has given the race the damaging reputation which it has for unreliability. 
I speak of these things repeatedly and so plainly because I am constantly meeting persons who are employers or who would be employers of our people. And they tell me every time when I speak to them about work that their only objection to employing coloured labour is this very matter I have been speaking of. It's unreliability. Many of them say that they want to employ coloured people, would be glad to give them places of responsibility, but that they cannot find men who will stick to their work. You may say that it is impossible for us to grow and develop, to get positions of trust and responsibility that will pay good wages, simply because we are coloured. I will give you an example on this very point. A few days ago I was in New Orleans, visiting a large sugar refinery. The firm which operates this refinery employs from 200 to 300 men. I found the young man who has charge of all the bookkeeping of the firm, through whose hands all the business and cash of the firm pass. I found this man to be coloured, and that all the other persons filling responsible positions under him were white. I remember some two or three years ago having met one of the partners of this firm in the White Mountains, and he told me at that time of this young man. He told me that a great many persons came to him and said, You ought not to have this coloured man filling this position when there are so many white persons who want the place. He told me that he said to these persons, This young man does my work better than anyone else I have yet found. And so long as he does this, so long shall I employ him. This gentleman has since died, but the business is in the hands of his widow, who has so much confidence in the ability of this young coloured man to manage the affairs of a great business. Mr. Lewis is his name. Perhaps some of you know him, that he is retained practically at the head of this great establishment. This single instance shows that notwithstanding his colour, a man can rise for what is in him, that he can advance when he shows that he can be depended upon. Remember that whether you are hackmen or businessmen, it pays whenever you cannot fill an engagement to explain beforehand why you cannot, and that unless you make a practice of doing this, it will be impossible for you to get ahead or to attain to places of trust and responsibility, no matter how much education you may have. As I have so often said before, if we cannot send out from Tuskegee and similar schools young men and women who can be depended upon, our reputation as a race, for the years that are to come, is not going to be very bright. On the other hand, if we can succeed in sending out young men and women with a high sense of responsibility, who can at all times be relied upon to be prompt in business matters, we shall have gone a long way in redeeming the character of the race and in lifting it up. In this important matter, all of you can help. Do not wait until you go out from Tuskegee, but begin tomorrow morning every boy and girl, to be reliable and to keep at it until reliability becomes a part of you. End of chapter 17 Keeping Your Word Recording by Luke Sartor Griffith, New South Wales Chapter 18 of Character Building this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Luke Sartor Character Building by Booker T. Washington Chapter 18 Some Lessons of the Hour This evening, I am going to remind you of a few things which you should get out of the school year. But it will be of very little use for me to do this, unless you make up your minds to do two things. In the first place, 
you must resolve that you are going to remember the things I am going to say. And in the second place, you must put my suggestions into practice. If you will make up your minds then that you are going to hold on to these suggestions so far as your memory is concerned, and then so far as possible put them into practice, we shall be able to discuss something that will be of profit to you during the year. I want you to get it firmly fixed in your minds that books, industries or tools of any character, no matter how thoroughly you master them, do not within themselves constitute education. Committing to memory pages of written matter or becoming deft in the handling of tools is not the supreme thing at which education aims. Books, tools and industries are but the means to fit you for something that is higher and better. All these are not ends within themselves. They are simply means. The end of all education, whether of head or hand or heart, is to make an individual good, to make him useful, to make him powerful, is to give him goodness, usefulness and power in order that he may exert a helpful influence upon his fellows. One of the things I want you to get out of this year is the ability to put a proper value upon time. If there is any one lesson that we all of us need to have impressed upon us more thoroughly and more constantly than any other, it is that each minute of our lives is of supreme value and that we are committing a sin when we allow a single minute to go to waste. Remember that every five minutes of time you are spending at this institution is worth so much money to you. How many people there are who, after they have arrived at the ages of sixty, seventy or eighty years, look back with regret and say, I wish I could live the years over again. But they cannot. All they can do is to regret that they have wasted precious minutes, precious hours. Now your lives are yet before you, not, as in the case of these people, behind you. Your lives are yet to be lived, and they will be made successful lives just in proportion as you learn to place a value upon the minutes. Spend every minute here in hard, earnest study or in helpful recreation. Be sure that none of your time is thrown away. Among other things, you should get out of the year the habit of reading. Any individual who has learned to love good books, to love the best newspapers, the best magazines, and has learned to spend some portion of the day in communication with them, is a happy individual. You should get yourselves to the point where you will not be happy unless you do spend a part of each day in this way. You should get out of the year the habit of being kind and polite to every individual. As a general thing, it is not difficult for a person to be polite in words and courteous in actions to individuals who are classed in the same social scale, or who, perhaps, are above him in wealth and influence. The test of a true lady or gentleman comes when that individual is brought in contact with someone who is considered beneath her or him. Some one of us is ignorant or poor. Show me a man who is himself wealthy and who is gentle and polite to the ignorant about him and to the poor people about him, and I will show you every time a true gentleman. When Prince Henry of Prussia was in this country, I remember reading this description of one of the prominent public men who received him. He is such a true gentleman that he can meet a prince without himself becoming embarrassed and can meet a poor man without embarrassing the poor man. Learn to speak kindly to every individual, white or black. No man loses anything by being gentlemanly, by learning to be polite, by treating the most unfortunate individual with the highest deference. 
We want you to learn to control your temper. Someone has said that the difference between an animal and a man is that the beast has no method of learning to control his temper. With the individual, the human being, there is education and training. He learns to master himself, to have an even temper, learns to master his temper completely. Now, if any of you have a temper that often gets to be your master, make up your mind that it is a part of your duty here to learn to control it. Step upon it, as it were, and say, I will be master of my temper, instead of letting it be my master. You want to have that kind of courage that is going to make you able to speak the truth at all times, no matter what it may seem to cost you. This may, for the time being, seem to make you unpopular. It may inconvenience you. It may deprive you of something that you count dear. But the individual who cultivates that kind of courage, who, at the cost of everything, always speaks the truth, is the individual who in the end will be successful, is the one who in the end will come out the conqueror. You cannot afford to learn to speak anything but the absolute truth. One of the most beautiful things that I have seen printed about President Roosevelt was where someone wrote of him that one of the President's greatest faults was that he did not know when to lie, when to deceive people, but that he always spoke the absolute, frank truth. As a result of his honesty, his truth-speaking, he is at the head of the nation. We also want you to learn to be absolutely honest in all your dealings with other people's property. We may just as well speak plainly and emphatically. One of our worst sins, one of our weaknesses, is that of not being able to handle other people's property and be honest with it. You should learn to be absolutely honest with the property of your roommates, schoolmates and teachers. Make up your minds that nothing is going to tempt you from the path of absolute honesty. There is no man or woman who begins with meddling with other people's property and affairs, who begins to learn to take that which does not belong to him or her, who is not beginning in a downward path ending in misery, sorrow and disappointment. Make up your minds that you are going to be absolutely honest and truthful in all cases. There is no way to get happiness out of life. There is no way to get satisfaction out of your school career except by following the lessons that I have here tried to emphasize. When we speak of honesty, the first thought may be that the word applies only to the taking of property that does not belong to us. But this is not so. It is possible for a person to be dishonest by taking time or energy that belongs to someone else, just as much as tangible property. In going into a classroom, office, store or shop, one man may ask himself the question, how little can I do today and still get through the day? Another man will have constantly before him the question, how much can I put into this hour or this day? Now we expect every student who goes out from Tuskegee to be, not the man who tries to see how little he can do, or the average man who proposes to do merely his duty, but the man above the average who will do more than his duty. And you will disappoint us unless you are above the average man, unless you go out from here with the determination that you are going to perform more than your duty. I like to see young men or young women who, if employed in any capacity, no matter how small or unimportant that capacity may be, if the hour is eight o'clock at which they must come to work, I like to see them at work ten or fifteen minutes before that hour. I like to see a man or woman who, if the closing hour is five o'clock or six o'clock, goes to the person in charge and says, Shall I not stay longer? Is there not something else I ought to do before I go? 
put your whole souls into whatever you attempt to do. That is honesty. Another thing you should learn this year is to get into touch with the best people there are in the world. You should learn to associate with the best students in the institution. Take them as models and say that you are going to improve from month to month and from year to year until you are as good as they are or better. You cannot reach these things all at once, but I hope that each one of you will make up his mind or her mind that from tonight, throughout the year and throughout life, there is going to be a hard striving on your part toward reaching the best results. If you do this, when you get ready to leave this institution, you will find that it has been worth your while to have spent your time here. End of chapter 18 Some Lessons of the Hour Recording by Luke Sartor, Griffith, New South Wales. Chapter 19 of Character Building This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Luke Sartor Character Building by Booker T. Washington Chapter 19 The Gospel of Service The subject on which I am going to speak to you for a few minutes tonight, the Gospel of Service, may not, when you first hear it, strike a very responsive chord in your hearts and minds. But I assure you, I have nothing but the very highest and best interest of the race at heart when I select this subject to talk about. The word service has too often been misunderstood, and on this account it has in too many cases carried with it a meaning which indicates degradation. Every individual serves another in some capacity, or should do so. Christ said that he who would become the greatest of all must become the servant of all. That is, he meant that in proportion as one renders service, he becomes great. The President of the United States is a servant of the people, because he serves them. The Governor of Alabama is a servant, because he renders service to the people of the state. The greatest merchant in Montgomery is a servant, because he renders service to his customers. The school teacher is a servant, because it is his duty to serve the best interests of his pupils. The cook is a servant because it is her duty to serve those for whom she works. The housemaid is a servant, because it is her duty to care for the property entrusted to her in the best manner in which she is able. In one way or another, every individual who amounts to anything is a servant. The man or the woman who is not a servant is one who accomplishes nothing. It is very often true that a race, like an individual, does not appreciate the opportunities that are spread out before it, until those opportunities have disappeared. Before us, as a race in the South today, there is a vast field for service and usefulness, which is still in our hands, but which I fear will not be ours to the same extent very much longer, unless we change our ideas of service, and put new life, put new dignity and intelligence into it. Perhaps I am right in thinking that in no department of life has there been such great progress and such changes for the better during the last ten years as in the department of domestic service or housekeeping. The cook who does not make herself intelligent, who does not learn to do things in the latest and in the neatest and cleanest manner, will soon find herself without employment, or will at least find herself a drug on the market instead of being sought after and paid higher wages. The woman who does not keep up with all the latest methods of decorating and setting her table, and of putting the food on it properly, will find her occupation gone within a few years. The same is true of general housekeeping, of laundering, and of nursing. All the occupations of which I have been talking 
are at present in our hands in the South, but I repeat that a very great progress is being made in all of them in every part of the world, and we shall find that we shall lose them unless our women go forward and get rid of the old idea that such occupations are fit only for ignorant people to follow. At the present time, scores of books and magazines are appearing bearing upon every branch of domestic service. People are learning to do things in an intelligent and scientific manner. Not long ago I sat for an hour and listened to a lecture delivered upon the subject of dusting, and it was one of the most valuable hours I ever spent. The person who gave this lecture upon dusting was a highly educated and cultivated woman, and her audience was composed of wealthy and cultivated people. We should bring ourselves to the point where we can feel that one who cooks and does it well should be just as much honoured as the person who teaches school. What I have said in regard to the employments of our women is equally true of the occupations followed by our men. It is true that at present we are largely cultivating the soil of the South, but if other people learn to do this work more intelligently, learn more about labour-saving machinery, and become more conscientious about their work than we, we shall find our occupation departing. It used to be the case in many parts of the North that the Negro was the coachman, but in a very large degree in cities like New York and Philadelphia, the Negro has lost this occupation, and lost it, in my opinion, not because he was a Negro, but because in many cases he did not see that the occupation of coachman was constantly being improved. It has been improved and lifted up until now it has almost become a profession. The Negro who expects to remain a coachman should learn the proper dress for a coachman and learn how to care for horses and vehicles in the most approved. What is true of the coachman is true of the butler. In too many cases, I fear, we use these occupations merely as stepping stones, holding on to them until we can find something else to do, in a careless and shipshod manner. We want to change all this, and put our whole souls into these occupations, and in a large degree make them our life work. In proportion as we do this, we shall lay a foundation upon which our children and grandchildren are to rise to higher things. The foundation of every race must be laid in the common everyday occupations that are right about our doors. It should not be our thought to see how little we can put into our work, but how much. Not how quickly we can get rid of our tasks, but how well we can do them. I often wish that I had the means to put into every city a large training school for giving instruction in all lines of domestic service. Few things would add more to the fundamental usefulness of the race than such a school. Perhaps it may be suggested that my argument has reference only to our serving white people. It has reference to doing whatever we do in the best manner, no matter whom we serve. The individual who serves a black man will serve a white man poorly. Let me illustrate what I mean. In a southern city, a few days ago, I found a large hotel conducted by coloured people. It is one of the very cleanest and best and most attractive hotels for coloured people that I have found in any part of the country. In talking with the proprietors, I asked them what was the greatest obstacle they had had to overcome, and they told me it wasn't finding coloured women to work in the house who would do their work systematically and well. Women who would, in a word, keep the rooms in every part of the hotel thoroughly swept and cleaned. This hotel had been opened three months, and I found that during that time the proprietors had employed fifteen different chambermaids, and they had got rid of a large proportion of these, simply because they were determined not to have people in their employment who did not do their work well. One weakness pertaining to the whole matter of domestic employment in the South, at present, is this. It is too easy for our people to find work. If there was a rule followed in every family that employs persons, 
that no man or woman should be hired unless he or she brought a letter of recommendation from the last employer, we should find that the whole matter of domestic service would be lifted up a hundred percent. So long as an individual can do poor work for one family, and perhaps be dishonest at the same time, and be sure that he or she will be employed by some other family, without regard to the kind of service rendered the last employer, so long will domestic service be poor and unsatisfactory. Many white people seldom come in contact with the Negro in any other capacity than that of domestic service. If they get a poor idea of our character and service in that respect, they will infer that the entire life of the Negro is unsatisfactory from every point of view. We want to be sure that wherever our life touches that of the white man, we conduct ourselves so that he will get the best impression possible of us. In spite of all the fault I have found, I would say this before I stop. I recognize that the people of no race, under similar circumstances, have made greater progress in thirty-five years than is true of the people of the Negro race. If I have spoken to you thus plainly and frankly, it is that our progress in the future may be still greater than it has been in the past. End of chapter 19 The Gospel of Service Recording by Luke Sartor Griffith, New South Wales Chapter 20 of Character Building This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Luke Sartor Character Building by Booker T. Washington Chapter 20 Your Part in the Negro Conference For eight or nine years now, it has been our custom to hold here what is known as the Tuskegee Negro Conference. A number of years ago it occurred to some of us that instead of confining the work of this institution to the immediate body of students gathered within its walls, we perhaps could extend and broaden its scope so as to reach out to and try to help the parents of the students and the older people in the country districts and, to some extent, if possible, in the cities also. With this end in view, we, some years ago, invited a number of men and women to come and spend the day with us, and while here, to tell us, in a very plain and straightforward manner, something about their material, moral, and religious condition. Then the afternoon of that same day was spent in hearing from these same men and women suggestions as to how they thought this institution and other institutions might help them, and also how they thought they might help themselves. Out of these simple and small meetings has grown what we now call the Tuskegee Negro Conference, which in the last few years has grown until it numbers from 900 to 1,200 persons. We not only have that large number of persons, most of whom come from farms and are engaged in farm work, 